Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm Mark Coleman from Paul's Photo and the Creative Photo Academy. It's my great pleasure to welcome you all here today for our presentation, our discussion with Tom Hogan and myself on the new Nikon Z9, the new Nikon flagship camera. And um, you all know Tom from his, you know, for buy Dom, buy Tom com. Oh my God, that, that always gets me every time, doesn't it? So uh, what a great inspiration he is with great knowledge and great thoughts. And so we want to thank you for coming tonight and helping support our small family camera store in Torrance, California. You know, Tom will be the first one to tell you to support your local store. And if you guys don't have a local camera store in your neighborhood, please give us a call. We'll be glad to take care of you like you, you were right down the street. So um, without any further ado, Tom, are you ready? Yep, yeah, I'm ready. And by the way, Tim, the answer is yes. Well, but so, but it's trains, planes, and automobile focus, right? Well, we'll talk about it, but, but the, <laughs> the answer is yes. The answer is yes. So, um, so what we're going to do is, um, I'm I've got a, a presentation that Tom and I are going to talk on. If you guys have questions, put those into the chat. Um, if there's an immediate relevant question to the slide, we'll answer it. If not, we'll take the questions at the end. You okay with that, Tom? Yep, I'm fine. Awesome. Here we go. And I just hope this works. Yeah, because it's <laughs> always fun on Zoom. All right. So, Tom, can you see the slideshow? Yes, I can, but you've taken up my whole screen. Oh, well, you can drag me to the side. Yeah, I, I know. I, I got I to gotta change that. But uh... So you guys can know how to do that. You can drag the slideshow over and see Tom and I in the side. Um, please open up the chat window. And if you've noticed, I've left a lot of white on the slide of the, of the side of the slide presentation for the chat window. And yes, Debbie, we are recording it. So those of you who registered tonight will get the recording tomorrow. So I want to welcome you to our presentation on the Nikon Z9. And you've got Mark and Tom here. So, wow. We got a lot to do tonight, don't we, Tom? Uh, a lot to talk about um, and a lot of details that are um, getting glossed over a little bit by some yeah. or, or, or causing questions to come up. And that's one of the things that I hope that we can try and address uh, today is, is tamp down some of the questions, get the answers to you. So Tom, do you still love the Z? <laughs> uh, do I love anything? Um, you know, people call me a, 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 a an old, uh, old sarcastic guy who doesn't like anything, but I actually love photography. I love a lot of cameras. The Z's have worked really incredibly well for me. Um, you know, I think uh, Nikon's been underrated. Yeah, curmudgeon is the word I was looking for. Thank you, uh, Robert and Ed. Um, the uh, you know, the, I think the, the Z's have been underrated by a lot of people. And of course, there's a lot of there's a lot of disinformation and fanboyism on the web that tries to tries to play down uh, products from uh, competitors. Uh, and and that doesn't help either. It kind of just makes for noise where you can't actually see what's really going on. But yeah, uh, definitely the Z's have been great cameras so far. Uh, everybody I've talked to, um, you know, I've talked to, I, I deal with a lot of pros. I help some pros uh, with, with uh, some of the things that they're trying to do. Um, and, uh, you know, so um, every pro I know that's gotten into the Z's, I mean, they, they, they instantly like lots of things about these cameras. And, and it's not just the cameras, the lenses are, have been incredibly good so far. So, um does that answer your question no yeah and i just wanted to chime in that i've never been happier with a camera than i am with the z7 ii i'm excited about the z9 and i've never been happier with a kit than i have been with the z kit you know my 14 to 30 24 to 70 70 to 200 kit that i carry every day i carry that camera with me everywhere and it's amazing and from Mark as a photographer to Mark, a camera store owner, 
I can tell you how much my customers and students love the Z because of the better performance, the lighter weight, the, the new features that we talked about during the Z6, Z7 II presentation we did, Tom. And we'll address some of that tonight. But my right. answer is, yeah, I do love it. And, and one I, of the- I, I don't think I'm a curmudgeon. Why, why? <laughs> well, I know I am. <laughs> um, the, one of the reasons why the Z9 has generated so much interest is that it does solve a few of the things uh, and, and clear up some of the frustrations that some people have had with the with the Z's. Um, you know, if you try and shoot at uh, 10 frames or 14 frames per second with uh, the Z6 or Z7, um, there are some things that will might start to frustrate you at 5.5 frames a second. It's a great camera, both of them. Yes, I agree. Um, and so the Z9 is now pushing that 20 frames a second, 30 frames a second, 120 frames a second with some dependencies. And you know, in my brief handling with the Z9, the viewfinder at 20 frames per second is phenomenal. You know, okay. it allows us to capture images and see things in, through the viewfinder with the benefits of electronic viewfinder without the detriments of the electronic viewfinder, in my opinion. Right. So Mark's showing some of the, and Nikon has shared with us uh, uh, almost all of their, their launch images. Uh, so we can show some images that are coming from the Z9. Um, um, and, uh, you know, the, they're all great images, images that most of us would be proud to, to have in our portfolios. Um, and they all show off kind of different aspects of the camera. Um, and so we'll talk about those aspects uh, as we get into it. So first impressions of the camera. <laughs> well, it's it's a professional camera. Um, you know, it's it's not a. You, you talked about the Z6 and Z7s and and, and your kit being small. Uh, the Z9 is a little bigger camera. It's a little heavier camera. Um, it is smaller than um, the D850 with the uh, motor grip on it in terms of height and um, depth, but uh, it's not a small camera. So. You know, the first impression is that it's it's like the D1, the D2, the D3, the D4, the D5, the D6. It's a big, rugged camera. Yeah, and, and I am very excited to be able to photograph with the Z9, you know, for my sports and wildlife photography. Um, the Z9 is not a camera for everyone. I, I, I've told a few of my customers you know, Z9 is may not be the right choice for you because you went to the Z to lighten your load to get a smaller camera. You traded in a D850 or a D5 to get a Z7. So why would you go back to a Z9 unless you need that extra performance? So there's a question, do I have a Z9 here with me? No, I don't have one with me. I've only been able to, like Mark, I've only been able to handle it briefly. Um, the thing I talk, say about the for a large camera the grip feels right. Um, if Nikon did anything correct on this camera is that they've got the grip positions and the control positions pretty nailed down. Um, you know, Nikon makes a makes a statement about it's 20% smaller in overall area than a D6. That doesn't isn't the thing that I would be looking at first. The first thing I looked at when I picked up the camera was how does the grip feel? Because this is a camera that I'd be using, you know, all day on a wildlife sit top safari, um, all afternoon at a sporting event. I'm going to be holding it for a long time. So if the grip doesn't feel good, uh, that would be a problem. It feels really nice, though. Um, and and I it, think that Tom it, comes from the thinner body design on the mirrorless design. Some of it. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. All right. So I wanted to talk about, you know, Nikon, you know, Nikon loves the Z9. And it's been very, very clear, even in the build up to the announcement, that Nikon executives, managers, product managers, the NPS staff, everybody who was starting to hold on to the camera, and even the photographers that I knew that uh, had a chance to use it, were all really excited about it. So Nikon has made a number of claims 
relative to the competition, which is unusual. Nikon usually doesn't, they didn't say specifically who they were targeting with each of these claims, but Nikon usually doesn't make these kinds of claims spot on to the competition. It has the most subject recognition of any camera. So it recognizes humans, dogs, cats, birds, trains, planes, automobile, automobiles, motorcycles, and bicycles. Um, and even beyond that, it, it, it's very clear in looking at uh, examples uh, and working with people that it recognizes other animals as well. But those are the nine things that Nikon will claim. There's no other camera out there right now that, that really looks at so many different subjects and can distinguish them. Um, and that'll come up again in 3D tracking, by the way. It has the world's fastest continuous shooting. Yes, it's 11 frame, uh, 11 megapixels, but um, I'll remind you that the D3 was 12 megapixels in 2007. We were really, really happy to get, uh, what was it, 10 uh, frames a second out of that. Uh, we basically, um, you know, have gone an order of magnitude faster now with essentially um, better in image quality too. Uh, it has the fastest scan rate on an image sensor, still being discussed is exactly what that is. Uh, DP review is saying 1 to 70th of a second is what they measure. Nikon's being a little coy. They're talking about it's the same speed as the shutter, uh, a mechanical shutter, which would be 1 to 50th of a second uh, uh, moving across the frame. Um, so, Tom, what does that fastest scan rate, what, what does that mean to us as photographers? means that you, you can treat the camera exactly the same um, as if it had a mechanical shutter. Um, wow. You don't have a mechanical shutter sitting there flapping and wearing out all the time uh, and making noise, but you can treat the camera exactly the same as you've been shooting uh, with uh, uh, any camera that had a mechanical shutter. Uh, the first truly blackout free viewfinder and, and specifically, and this is something that's come up, you know, I have a Sony A1 and I use a Sony A1 for some work. Uh, I prefer my Nikon D6 for sports. Uh, I prefer the Sony A1 right now for animal and wildlife photography, but that may change with the Z9. We'll find out really, really quickly. Um, but one of the things I noticed about the A1 is that while it has blackout free uh, viewfinder every now and then it just seems to have a stutter or a hesitancy or a skip um, and and it doesn't bother me um, but nevertheless it's there um, Nikon's claiming they don't do that they're also claiming they have the brightest EVF on the market uh, by three times um, 3,000 candelas per meter squared which is what a nit is um, uh, and uh, that, that's one I look forward to, to seeing. Um, by the way, they also have put in a night vision um, capability into the camera as well to protect your night vision when you're shooting uh, with the EVF. So that's a really interesting uh, bit that you need to know. Has I'm really eating. excited about that because you know we do a fair amount of night photography, star trails, that kind of thing here, Tom. Yeah. and. Photography Always. doesn't stop at happy hour. No. Well, I hope not. <laughs> but yeah, so it's always been. And it's great because you see when my group is out there in the field, you see, I can see where everybody is because you see the, the viewfinders and the LCDs, you know, blaring right. across the desert. Right. right? Exactly. And, uh, you know, it has class leading video resolution and internal recording capability. As far as I know, there's not another, another, uh, mirrorless SLR type camera that can do uh, internal 10 bit 422 ProRes um, HQ. It has the longest recording time, um, and Nikon called that out specifically 125 minutes versus competitors uh, 30 minutes. So the thing to take away from this is Nikon is boldly making claims about this camera. They are incredibly confident about how good this camera is. Um, you generally don't see Nikon marketing being that confident. They, they do marketing and they tell you 
all the things about their cameras that are good, etc. But this time around, they're hammering very, very specific points. So then the second part of this, if you move to the next slide, they also made a bunch of comments uh, uh, specifically about claims to the Z system itself. The one that gets the most attention is that's the first Nikon cam camera with a four axis uh, rear LCD. But there's some other ones there that are more interesting. It's the fastest startup of any Nikon Z camera. They specifically are claiming 2.5 times faster at starting up. Um, that comes out of the Xpeed processor as well, that it's just able to get the camera cycled up and ready to take that first shot faster than um, a Z7 or a Z6. And, and those are no slouches. I mean, I, I, I have no problem turning my camera off turning it on, pulling, pulling up my face and taking a shot. But the Z9 is going to be even faster than that. They also talk about more autofocus targets in uh, auto uh, autofocus. So we have big boxes in um, the Z6 and the Z7. We have 81 of those boxes in auto area. They're fairly big. The boxes in the Z9 are smaller. 493 of them versus 81 in the same uh, frame space. So the discretion of where the camera is actually focused in an auto area is higher. Um, and that gets to some of the autofocus stuff that we'll talk about. Has 12 times faster readout uh, speed from the sensor than the Z7 II. It has a 10 times faster processor um, than the D Z7 II. It has reduced HDMI output latency. I know there's been a few video people who are recording to Atomos and other recorders who say, yeah, there's a sync issue, especially if you put your microphone into the Atomos and you have the video coming in from uh, your camera, you can get a latency issue that you have to deal with. Um, they're talking about uh, the best latency that they've had. Uh, and then they're talking about full functionality uh, with 90 F mount lenses with the FTZ2. So those are some of the claims that I just wanted to put them out there because Nikon is making very, very specific and bold claims up front, which means they're incredibly confident, confident about this camera. We should all expect it to perform quite well. So we just put together a couple of slides to help you guys understand what's new. And so this is the front of the camera. You know, the first thing that I see, there are three function buttons on the right-hand side, which is really cool. And I'm excited about that. Um, right. And when you handle the camera, you're going to find that when you go to the vertical grip position, function uh, button number three is about in the same finger position as uh, for the vertical grip as function button number one is on the horizontal grip. Uh, I wish they had, had, had completely duplicated it, but it does mean that you can get a front function button that works with both the vertical and the horizontal grip the same. And I, I use the camera, I tried the camera both in landscape and portrait and it flips very well, had a very nice feeling there, so. Yeah, again, uh, the, the, the two grips are, are pretty much identical. Now, we were just looking inside the front of the camera, and one of the differences is the sensor. Now, Nikon's saying this is a new sensor. So on the left is the Z7 sensor, uh, the best picture that I have of it so far. And on the right is the Z9 sensor, the best picture of it I have so far. And the things that you look at trying to figure out, you know, there's the question, who made the sensor? Um, I don't think it matters, but the things that you look at are the connects. So you'll notice on the Z7 sensor, there's connects all the way around the sensor um, that are, are pretty evenly exposed. And on the Z9 sensor, that has definitely changed. Um, and um, so it, it definitely came off of a different fab um, than the Z7 sensor. So when Nikon says it's not the Z7 sensor, it's not the Z7 sensor. It's a new sensor. It really is a new sensor. Um, um, 
So Tom, there was a question about the cropping of the sen He asked why is the crop the sensor cropped? He noticed, as you pointed out, the difference in the megapixels. Yeah, we're going to get to that coming up. Uh, I okay. Kind of, I kind of want to withhold that one for the moment. Okay. Um, um, because it comes up with a specific part of the way the camera functions. Um, and I, I don't want to start talking about that before we get to that. Great, perfect. Um, the back of the camera, as you can see, is classic D3, D4, D5, uh, D6 kind of design with the controls repeated for the vertical grip uh, as best as possible. Um, the one difference um, is that these, uh, you know, if I, this is a Z6 II that I've got here. Um, this, the way these buttons are organized on this camera, Nikon is trying to replicate um, that as best as possible across all their cameras now. So there are some changes to where certain things are, like the, the one that keeps coming up is, oh, but the play but, uh, playback button is no longer in the upper left-hand corner. Um, yeah, uh, Nikon is trying to put it in a place where you can get to it with single hand operation. If you really need the playback button in the upper left hand corner, note that the upper left hand corner is function button number four and you can assign playback to it. I did, I did manage to verify that. So, um, you know, if that's what you want, you can get it. Sorry about that, Tom. So there was a question about the anti-aliasing filter. What have you heard there about is the anti-aliasing filter? There is none. Yes. Um, there was a confusion based upon the early Nikon wording. Um, on the day of the announcement, they, they talked about the filter layer over the sensor, and they used a word um, that I think confused everybody. Um, as far as I know, there's no anti-aliasing uh, filter over the sensor. Nikon seems to have confirmed that um, several times now. What is over the sensor is two different layers um, that have to do with uh, dust uh, and, and uh, trying to keep dust uh, from building up on the sensor. So there's now a new anti-static coating layer um, that attempts to make it so that dust doesn't cling to the front of that filter. Um, and then the very front of that filter is now fluorine coated, which means that it uh, will tend to shed water and dust and anything else um, that uh, sticks, uh, that, that comes and hits that uh, uh, front of that filter. Now you still have to have a filter on top of your sensor because what you want to do is you want to, you want to uh, eradicate UV and uh, near IR uh, light. So that's what that filter is now doing. It's, uh, it's repelling dust um, and it's doing uh, UV and near um, IR filtering, but it is not doing low pass filtering. Great. So people are asking questions about the customizable buttons and- I don't know all of them yet, um, so, so I can't tell you about all the customizations. I did notice one thing that I hope is going to change, and that's that a lot of the customizations, you get a choice between type A, type B, type C, instead of it being defined as something. Um, there is help that tells you what type A means, but this is sort of the thing that I had the problem with, with Olympus's menus, which, which was, you know, there's type one, type two, type three, type four things. It's like, well, I can't remember what all those things mean. And type A for this setting might is different than type A for this setting. So um, I hope that changes at some point uh, in the firmware. Uh, I've only seen a camera with early firmware so far. Um, and and uh, so I can't verify that that's the way it's going to be, but um, there's a lot of customization. Uh, one of the things I can tell you about, there are banks. Uh, so we have photo shooting banks. We have, uh, we now have a new set of banks, which is um, video recording banks. Uh, we, I don't believe we've ever had that before. Um, I've got to, I've got to pull my, the last camera that would have had that is this one. So 
Yeah, so, so this is a D6 and it does not have video recording banks. So this would be the first camera, as far as I know, that has uh, video recording banks. Uh, and it does have extended banks. So if, you're, if you know anything about banks, extended banks are a way of being able to uh, keep an exposure mode um, and other things uh, along with um, the, the bank information itself. Great. So please, gang, if you have questions, type your questions into the chat and please chat to everyone. Right. And, and, so, and, we, and we will we will go back over all these questions. I know we've glossed over a, a bunch of them. And I've seen them flow by. Um, we will go back and answer them in the questions session at the end. But it's really important that we get through some of these things because there are some things you probably haven't heard uh, that we're going to be talking about. So if we can move forward uh, the top of the camera, we still have an LED. You'll, you'll notice that around the shutter speed button, um, we have on off and we have the light position that you can turn on backlighting. The backlighting works for the top um, LED, but it also works for a set of buttons. It works for the four buttons you see on the upper left there in the cluster. And it works uh, for the buttons that are down in the this side of the camera, the right right side of the LCD. And I'm not sure about these two buttons. I think it's uh, it, it also works for those two buttons as well. So, so which buttons it, are you talking about, Tom? The 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 protect and the uh, delete button. I'm pretty sure it works for them as well. I I think so too. Uh, I can't remember off the top of my head. There's just so many things that have been thrown at me. And um, then the other thing, gang, is. You know, the cameras that Tom and I've seen are pre-production samples. Exactly. They're not the final version. So will there be major functional differences? No. Will there be these small little changes? Absolutely. Some of the buttons may not even be fully active in the, in the, the samples that we've seen. I'm pretty sure the buttons were all fully active on the camera. Well, but I... you know, the functions are not fully defined. Yeah, that's possible. So moving forward, um, the, the big news that, you know, Nikon made essentially two big claims for still photographers. One was frame rates and the other one was focus. So the frame, frame rates, you're able to set um, uh, self-timer. You can set single frame. You can set continuous low from one to 10. You can set continuous high at, 10, 12, 15, and 20 frames a second. Um, and all those have no real restrictions on them. You can shoot loss, lossless. Um, another thing many of you might not have uh, figured out yet is that there's no such thing as 12-bit RAW anymore. All RAW files are 14-bit. Um, so there's no restrictions on 12-bit or anything else up to 20 frames a second. Um, at 30 frames a second, the only restriction is you can't shoot raw. If you're shooting JPEG, still functional camera, every autofocus works, metering works, everything continues to work as before. If you set the camera, and, and that I believe is called uh, 30C um, as, the, as the frame rate. Um, at 120C, and again, this could change, uh, at 120C, you get 120 frames a second, but you get 11 megapixel JPEGs. Um, again, focus and metering and all the other stuff is still all active at 120 frames a second, uh, which i that's the part that I think everybody's finding incredible. When you, again, go back and think about it, the D3 in 2007 was uh, 10 frames a second uh, at 12 megapixels. And suddenly here we are in order of magnitude faster. Um, it's mind boggling. And, and I agree. You know, somebody asked me, so Mark, why would you shoot 20 frames per second or 120 frames per second if you're not doing super fast action? You know, and this was a portrait photographer. And I was telling him, you know, you're photographing a little child and you want that exact moment of the smile you know, at 20 frames per second, you're certainly going to capture it. And there's always a different way. And one of the cool things that I love is these new capabilities give us a new way to photograph. You know, Tom, and we can do the 
the 120 frames per second and then build a slow motion quick time video from it. You know, that stuff is really, and that it'll make that video built into the camera as well. So yeah, there, there are other reasons why I want 120 frames a second, but it's only for a few things. Yes. It does open up a whole new realm. You know, so one of the things I've been playing with uh, recently is motion and taking a, a fixed background with motion against it in the foreground. Right. And the, the trick with that has always been trying to get you know, motion there, motion here, motion here, motion here, and motion there that doesn't overlap. Well, at 120 yep. frames a second, I get more choices of where to put um you know the the, the motion um, even at 30 frames a second i get plenty of choices um yeah. 10 frames a second not so much five frames no. a second definitely not um you know i'm stuck with what the camera did so the the thing i think that and you see this with all of nikon's presentations and you hear it from people like mcnally and others where they're saying that this opens up new possibilities to them it makes them think about hey, there's something I couldn't do before that maybe I can do now. I'm going to experiment. I'm going to try something. And I think and that's that's the better way to think about 30 frames and 120 frames a second. 20 frames I, a second is perfectly fine for most action that I shoot. And we'll see new, new forms of photography, new ideas in a couple of months that are only possible with the technology that's available. And I'm that's one of the things that always has me so excited is you know what are you know and it's not me it's not tom it's what are you guys going to think up what application are you going to invent what do you mean uh, i want to think it frames up. per second i want to think it up <laughs> don't, don't let them think it up i want to think it up yeah but there's 200 of them and only two of us that's the problem that every pro faces is that is that there are infinite number of enthusiasts and amateurs out there that are trying things and we can't try all the possible things that they're trying so yeah it's really hard to stay on top of the uh, top of the heat but anyhow move, moving yeah. on well but somebody just asked about what about the picture quality on the 11 megapixel file that's what the d3 was 12 megapixels and we you know some of you chopped off your left arm to buy a d3 and here we are now at 120 frames per second with with uh, 11, 11 megapixels, so. Well, I, I mean, I, I, I go an entirely different way. I, we, can't, we can't really talk about image quality very much right now. We have examples that Nikon has shared with us and it allows us to share. Uh, we can't share anything of our own yet. Um, we will as soon as we possibly can, but, um, you know, we'll talk about image quality in a subsequent presentation um, in great depth, I'm sure. Right now, what I'm seeing, I like. Um, so we'll just stick with that. So 3D tracking autofocus. So in the DSLRs, 3D uh, um, tracking autofocus. So the this D6 that I have here, when it tracks it's using a sensor up in the viewfinder that is actually an image sensor um, and that image sensor is tracking is capturing color information and shape information so there is some uh, recognition in a d6 but it's somewhat crude um, but that's what it was doing so it would find a pattern and a color within a pattern and this worked ex exceptionally well with face tones because a face is a pattern and a face tone is within a fairly fixed range so once a d6 found that it could track that throughout the entire autofocus area so there's two differences um, that are coming up with the z9 one is it can track auto uh, 3d track across the entire display so you know, from the top of the screen to the bottom of the screen, from the left of the screen to the right of the screen. It's actually 90%, 90%, I believe. Um, but beyond doing color and shape and, and focus distance recognition of a subject, it's doing one other thing. It's tracking all those subjects that we talked about before. Humans, cats, dogs, birds, trains, planes, motorcycles, 
uh, bicycles and cars. So if you have, like in this shot, you have a human. It found those humans and tracked one. In this case, it, um, I'm not sure how the 3D tracking was started. So I'm not sure how it found the one with the yellow cap, which of course is significant for Nikon because Nikon's corporate color is yellow, yellow. And that's the one that's gonna get to the marker first. Um, and a lot of people missed the metaphor there. Um, but uh, it was tracking this individual um, using the human subject as well as color, as well as shape. So that's new. Um, and of course, it's doing focus information at 120 frames a second. So there's 120 frames of focus information that's coming into the XP processor, uh, which is allowing um, this, this tracking to happen. So talking about uh, focus detect, uh, another thing that's not getting enough talk about is that we, you know, everybody talks about, oh, how good is the, the eye detection? How good is the face detection? Nikon has done something a little different than that. Uh, so for humans, they can recognize torso, head, face, and eyes. So imagine if she turned around for a moment, what would the camera start focusing on? The head, if the shape of the head is still distinct, it can see the back of the head and focus on the back of the head. Um, if it can't, uh, if, if for some reason something blocks the head it, uh, or partially blocks the head, it can still see the torso. So one of the things that's not talked about so much yet, and I wanna hear more from Nikon about how they're doing this, is that it's, it's almost like there's a hierarchy. I recognize a torso, I recognize a head, I recognize a face, I recognize an eye. Um, and I'll go to the smallest one of those that I can find, which is usually the eye. So when it's doing human detection, it'll go to the eye if it can find it. But if it can't find it, it'll go to the face. And if it can't find the face, it'll go to the head. <clears throat> if it can't find the head, it'll go to the torso. It's always doing human detection. So then in the other modes, moving oh, and, on. And I wanna add here, Tom, if you guys watch the launch videos, all of the ambassadors who spoke said that these features were changing the way they were able to photograph right. and how start, it made them, gave them more confidence. Right, you start watching the composition more than what um, the camera is doing is one thing that happens. Absolutely. And that's, and that's exactly what I want to have happen with my cameras is that I'm spending more time watching the framing that I'm doing and the timing of what's happening and not worrying about what the aperture is or the shutter speed or what setting I've got set on something um, that I'm, I'm able to not have to spend too much time with those things. So with animals, um, specifically, they talk about three types of animals they recognize cats, dogs, and birds, but it's clear from all the examples that they've shown. I mean, they showed fish, they showed uh, bears, they showed lions, they showed um, small, um, uh, they showed pikas, they showed small rodents. Uh, I mean, it's clear that it recognizes more than just cats and dogs uh, and birds. Uh, and again, it's the same thing. They recognize body, they recognize head, they recognize eyes. Um, so uh, the, the, there's a hierarchy. They're trying to find a body. If they can find a body, that's what they start to lock onto. If they can find a head on that body, they'll go to that. If they can find an eye on that body, they'll go to that. Um, and um, so that's, a, that's, a, uh, that's another thing to, to, to pay attention to. Um, and then moving on to the last category, which is vehicle. So with vehicles, it will look at the entire vehicle. It will go to the cockpit of the and cockpits loosely defined of the vehicle. Um, and it will go to the front of the vehicle. So you may have noticed in one of the examples that they showed is that the box started on the car, went to the front of the car and then went to the headlight of the car. That's a perfect example of how the camera was starting to prioritize down into a smaller space. Now, the question that came up when those first examples 
uh, started to appear on the internet was, but I don't want to focus on the front of the car. I don't want to focus on um, the front of a motorcycle. I've now seen enough images coming off the camera from other shooters. It's clear that it, if you've got a motorcycle rider and it can detect that there's a rider on the motorcycle, it's going to go to the rider on the motorcycle if it can see it. So I'm, I'm not at all worried that it's only going to focus on the front of a vehicle. Um, again, it's the same hierarchy system uh, as before. And this is one of the exciting parts is that there is not a lot a limit to this camera. <laughs> Um, we can go out to 900 seconds, which is 15 minutes. We can go to a 32 thousandth of a second. And I'll talk about that a little bit more and what that opens up in a, in a little bit. But it's important to know that's an incredible shutter speed. We have a shutter speed range and we really haven't had that before. And it does open up again. It's the same thing I said before. The camera's opening up opportunities for photographers to explore. And I agree, it, it, all these features, and for me, the shutter speed, Tom, like you, is ex exciting. You know, I was excited to get 900 seconds on the Z6 to Z7 to, you know, because of our astro low light photography that we do around here. But now to be able to explore super fast shutter speeds, to be able to explore shooting, you know, F1.4 lenses at ISO 200 in bright sunshine, Right. is also something that I'm very excited about. And what right. about, you know, none of us you presses the shutter speed high enough to see what extra action we can stop, you know, to get the sweat on the football player's face, to get, you know, like, you know, you, you, we talked about, you know, the, the, how it froze the golf ball and the head of the golf club here and how amazing that is. And it's just, right. yeah. Well, this new new thing, new new areas to explore, and I, I for one, love new areas to explore. I'm just a exactly. curious guy to start with, but um, so I'm I'm more than happy to uh, um, to to explore that. Um, you know, the ISO range is basically the same as the Z7. Uh, we can't really talk about what that really means yet because we can't really talk about image quality, um, and and as soon as we have cameras and we can start really testing them and putting them to their paces against other cameras, we can, but right now we really can't talk to that. The Flickr Free Viewfinder, again, if you've never used a Sony A9 or A1, um, you, you just, you, <laughs> you, you need to, and now, now you can add a Z9 to that as well. Uh, you really need to because it really does change things. I talked earlier about, um, you know, concentrating on composition. One of the toughest things in sports is to keep your framing. Um, you know, even with a D6 running as fast as it can, it has a really, really short blackout time. But even with a, a D6, sometimes I find myself at the very end of a sequence. I'm not quite on the framing exactly the way I want. And that's partly because I'm I'm getting that that blackout that's 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 kind of affecting me seeing stuff. It's a whole different experience when the viewfinder never blacks out. Now I knew this from way back because I used to be a video shooter. I mean, I was shooting video news back in the '70s, so so I had a blackout-free viewfinder all the time, and it was great because I could see exactly where to point my camera at the football player. Um, you know, I never had to worry about the shutter flapping in my way and, and then me wondering whether or not I was following at the right speed because, you know, football players will change speed as in the middle of a play um, and, and you need to be following that. And if that starts to happen in the middle of a blackout, sometimes you get a little off. So this is really one of the things I think is going to change. Uh, at least those that shoot action, uh, whether it be wildlife or sports, and, and even some events, uh, uh, event photographers. Well, and, you know, it's always been, you know, with an SLR camera, it's what you see is what you get, but it really is what you didn't see is what you get. And, you know, I was a rangefinder photographer for many years, Tom, for exactly that reason, because I wanted to feel the click and know that I got the magic moment. 
a, a lot of people don't understand that. Why, why did all the photojournalists use Leicas? Correct. It's because they were seeing through the viewfinder all the time and there wasn't right. anything blacking out on them. Uh, when you think back to those old mechanical days of film, film cameras, um, there could be significant blackout uh, where you weren't seeing what was going on. Whereas uh, when, when you used a rangefinder, you were seeing everything all the time. So it's exactly the same thing all over. Um, you know, photojournalists are going to love having a, a, a flicker, uh, a, a blackout free viewfinder for sure. You know, and for those, I, I got to see the Canon R3 over the weekend and it has the very same look and feel. So for those of you who are Canon people, you know, you're, the R3 is coming that will give you that experience. But, you know, a number of you in the chat were, you know, saying, is it bright enough? Is it clear enough? Is it great? I love the viewfinder through the Z9. And, you know, the feel of it, the look of it at 20 frames per second was just phenomenal. And I couldn't go back to an optical viewfinder. You know, I'm, I'm really spoiled by the live exposure and all the information. And now with the Z9, the customizable information that you have in the viewfinder to make it work, the, the camera work the way I want it to. And that's one of the things that we all need is we need the camera to work the way we want it to. You know, I noticed a couple of you are raising your hands. So please just type your questions into the chat. That way we can get to them. Um, any other well, comments on the view? While you move to the next slide, I'm gonna answer Jeff Jeffrey's uh, point he says the animal detect image looks manipulated uh, on natural blurring no not at all and it's something i'll talk about a little later um it's it's a very fast lens very close to an animal um and focused on a very very, very narrow range you have to remember nikon made a knocked in f0.95 lens well you can have a, a literally a a um focal plane that is as thin as I've ever seen um, on, on a camera. Now, whether you think that looks unnatural or not is a whole, whole different story, but it's a, another one of those examples of I can now start trying and doing things that I wasn't able to do before. Um, so video, um, I don't know how many people here. <laughs> Yeah, I don't uh, think we have a big video crowd with us tonight. Tom. Yeah, probably not a big video crowd, but um, this is definitely a good video camera. The video I've seen coming off of this uh, is impressive. Um, you know, being able to shoot 8K for 125 minutes at room temperature, that's yes. 73, 74 degrees. Uh, I noticed somebody very much earlier is how how did how was how was Nikon able to do that? Well, there's a fair amount of heat dissipation. Uh, plus, uh, the other thing is the same thing that's happening with the Apple uh, MacBook. So the, the more processing you put into a smaller spot, um, you can sometimes um, uh, make um, that work with less heat dissipation. Um, so chip size coming down is one of those things that uh, tends to affect that. So Tom, for your video work, do you have a separate video camera or are you using your mirrorless camera in the video mode for your video production stuff well, these days? Well, I used to have separate video cameras. I had a whole bunch of them. As you know, I sent you um, some of my B-roll yep. cameras uh, uh, because I've started getting rid of uh, my separate video cameras. But I'm actually about to go back to having um, a dedicated uh, video camera or two. However, those are going to be studio video cameras when I set up the new offices um, and uh, start doing more of this kind of thing. I'll have two dedicated video cameras that are that are looking at me. That's generally better for that. And, you know, I've mm -hmm. got this this switcher that I can switch between. So tally lights on the camera help me. There are lots of reasons to go to a dedicated video camera, but for most stuff, I mean, certainly for the things I'm doing video right now, um, the, the mirrorless cameras are just fine. Right. Um, you know, can you shoot a 115 degrees uh, 8K video? Well, I think you can. I just don't know how long. Um, I mean, it seems like McNally and some of the others were doing that. So 
um, clearly it works uh, in hot temperatures. It's just a question of how much reduced the time uh, would be. If you're really into video, you probably want to know about bit rates. These are the bit rates that we know about from the settings that are currently available in the camera. Um, you notice that it can record 10 bit uh, 422 internal to the camera, and it can do that in Apple um, ProRes 422HQ, uh, which is a really high bit rate. That's an incredibly good looking file. Um, the 8K at H265 was still a pretty good looking file that I saw. Um, so this camera is actually outputting some uh, some some pretty uh, remarkably good uh, video, and that's even before we get the raw capabilities. There will be a, uh, a, a firmware update that adds capabilities to this camera, uh, particularly in the video area, um, that are going to go even further than this. So this is awful good as it sits right here. Great. And, uh, unless somebody asks a video question, we should just move on to the still stuff. Yep. So everybody wants two cards and to get the speed up guys, you need to think about the compact flash express cards. You know, the two compact flash express cards, you know, the compact flash express is the most roast, most robust card on the market. I know it means that most of us are going to spend a lot of money on memory cards, but I think it's, it's well worth it to get the performance. Um, do you have comments about the cards, Tom? Well, if you, if, I mean, this, these were from your test. Uh, with this is from my test. Um, so, go ahead. And, and so you, you were reporting how many seconds of buffer. So if you go to the next side, slide. So, oh, I just want to explain how I, I mean, this is a oh, non-scientific oh, sure. test, sure. guys. I had 15 minutes with the camera. So we took the Z9 in manual exposure, manual focus, 14-bit raw lossless compression plus fine JPEG, so raw plus JPEG at continuous 20 frames per second. With an XQD card, the top XQD card, the Sony, I got about two seconds before the camera buffered. So what does that mean? You press the button, burp, dun, 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 right? Two seconds on the Sony. The Hoodman gave me three to four seconds. The Delkin Black, six to seven seconds and the prograde cobalt for eight to 10 seconds. So this is really important if you're gonna be doing video or if you're gonna be doing high frame rate continuous shooting. If you're gonna be doing landscape photography on a tripod with a, with a remote release, it doesn't make any difference. But I want the Z9 to be able to rock for me if I wanna do that fast action. So here's Tom's slide. So I've been collecting as much information as I can about uh, cards. Um, and this is sort of a summary of many of the things that I've seen. And uh, I know Matt Granger posted a new video today uh, with some new tests and they kind of correspond into these uh, same numbers. You're gonna find that it, it's a little different in everybody's test because no two raw files are exactly the same size. It depends on how much detail is in the image as to how much how big the file actually is. So unless we all standardize on taking photographs of exactly the same things, you can't exactly compare Matt's tests with Richie's tests, with my tests, with somebody else's tests. Um, but generally speaking, this the 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 C, uh, CFE type two cards are you know, getting 60 or more frames uh, as, before they hit the buffer. Um, and that's at lossless compressed. Where things start to get really interesting is in high efficiency star, um, which creates a smaller file size. You'll look at those numbers suddenly start to really go up very, very fast. Now, one of the things that Matt talked about in his video that he posted today was the sustained write performance. So <clears throat> I've actually been doing some lookup of sustained write performance. Um, Lexar doesn't publish theirs. Sony doesn't publish theirs, but a number of the other ones do. Uh, I actually think Matt got one of his numbers wrong. He's, the, his conclusion is still correct, but one of his numbers wasn't quite correct. So for prograde cards, prograde makes gold and they make cobalt. For this same size uh, prograde card, 
the gold has a sustained uh, write speed of 400 megabytes per second, whereas the cobalt has a sustained write speed of 1400 megabytes per second. So if you want really high numbers, you're going to want cards that have that higher sustained write speed. That's not the write speed that's on the front of the card. Um, you know, uh, let's see. I think I've got a card here. Yeah. You know, yeah, they a, all say 1700 yeah. or so yeah. on it. This one says 1700 megabits per second, and it's a yeah. it's a pro grade gold. Well, guess what? Uh, when you totally stress it and, and have it recording constantly, it's not 1700 megabits per second. It's 1400 megabits per second, which is still really good. And that's why um, you know, you're getting hundreds of high efficiency RAWs uh, before the buffer fills. So the Delkin Black is also 1400 megabits per sec uh, megabytes per second in its sustained rate. The Angelbird XT is guaranteed not to drop below 1480 megabytes per second, while the regular Angelbird card, not the XT, but the regular one, is a thousand megabytes per second, except for the 256 gigabyte card, which is only 550 megabytes per second. Uh, the Wise cards are different for each size. So the 64 uh, gigabyte card is 140 megabytes uh, per second. The 128 is 230 megabytes per second. And then the 512 gigabyte and higher is 400 megabytes per second. So I just spewed out a whole bunch of numbers. What does it really mean? Prograde Cobalt, Delkin Black, Angelbird XT. Those three have the highest sustained throughput. They're the ones that are going to give you the most buffer um, on uh, the Z9. The ones you probably want to avoid, the Y is 64. It's only 140 megabytes per second. That's one tenth the speed of the prograde cobalt. Um, so it's gonna it's gonna start to the buffer much, much faster. So one of the things that I will try and do uh, as soon as I have my camera and can robustly test all of this um, myself is I'll try and give you some better idea of exactly um, what cards you really probably want to be using for action. Um, but right now, ProGrade Cobalt, Delkin Black, Angelbird XT, those would be my choices if I think I'm going to be using the high frame rate all the time and buffering it. So you want to talk about this one, Mark? Well, yeah, I... And I forget where I heard it or saw it. I can't remember whether it was on the Nikon launch or someplace else, but I heard someone say that this is the most rugged and highly sealed camera that Nikon has ever made. And that makes me excited right. because as much as I take care of my camera, I don't want to have to baby my camera. I want to be able to take my camera and make the pictures that I want. If it's drizzling a little bit outside, if it's working, if it if it's all of uh, Peter, can you give this to Cheryl, please? Or is everybody <laughs> else gone? Okay, sorry, sorry guys. Um, so I want my camera to be able to take the pictures that I want to take, regardless of the situation. And having the camera rugged and and put together right is gonna make it give me the pictures that I want. And that right. that's so, important. So Mark's Mark's showing the front uh, ceiling, and that's the rear ceiling. Uh, if you look at my little picture, um, there's extensive ceiling. But the real interesting thing is when you look at the frame of the camera, um, the frame of the camera is, you, know, you notice that the only place there's holes in the camera are where there are controls, basically. Um, and uh, those, if you go back uh, a slide, um you you would see that um every one of those holes is sealed so this camera is uh, going to be particularly robust um and the other part of that which 
doesn't really get talked about as much. Um, let me uh, see if I see where that is here real quick. Um, I gotta find it. I've got all these images here. And I gotta find the one I'm looking for. But uh, when you look at the lenses, the lenses also um, are well sealed. So the here, same Tom, thing. I'm going to let you share your screen. Go ahead. OK. Do, do, do. What do I want to share? What do I want to share? I don't know what I want to share. Let's share the desktop. Share the desktop. Oh, I haven't been doing this for a while, so I have to hold on just, just a moment. So the green box in the bottom, share screen. Yeah, no, I, I, I haven't unlocked. Apple okay. changed their system, of course, and uh, I can't, I can't do it until Apple says I can do it. Right, share screen. Oh, no, what I. I want, really want to do you you want to zoom up the my my picture so this guy up here you want to zoom okay so, zoom so everyone me. you can grab tom's picture and you can just make it bigger right in the view so the the point the point that the, the you know, Nikon has made and, and almost all these um, Z mount lenses have really good sealing. Um, you'll see that they're, this is the 24 to 120. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different areas that are completely sealed off the, on, on this lens. So you combine lens sealing with the uh, with the camera sealing, you put fluorine coating on the front of the lens and guess what? You're relatively impervious to light water. That's um, you know mists, uh, light rain, that sort of thing. You don't worry about it as much. You know, I've used this this beast. Um, I've used this beast uh, out in pouring rain, um, and it does just fine as long as you make sure all your covers are closed. That you've got a hot shoe cover on the top. Um, that the car door is closed. Um, you know, that there's no access points that are like, I've got this flap that's open right now. That would not be a good thing. The Z9 is going to be exactly the same way. Exactly the same way. Awesome. Not going to be afraid to use it during a football game when it's raining. All right. I lost my chat. Hold on. So the dual articulated screen has everyone excited. Um, I will tell you that you have to get used to it. It doesn't just flip out. It only works. It's, but it's, this is going to be a feel thing. Like I said, I had 15 minutes with it, gang. So it flips out and then out. So we just got to get a feel for it. And generally so, you're going to be in the portrait mode and you want to flip it out, or you're going to be in the landscape mode and you pick flip it out. That it's going to work awesome for that. Right. And, and in terms of how much it goes, it will move. Uh, so in the horizontal position, it'll go 90 degrees up and it'll go 43 degrees down and the vertical uh, in the vertical position will go 90 degrees up and 23 degrees down. So it's not, it's not 180 degree flip screen. It, it has limits to how you can position it, but in the very short time I had to play with it, it had pretty much all the positions that I would be using it from the back of the camera. And that's all I agree. I, that's really all I was concerned about. And someone asked, does it does it reverse? No. no. You know, I put a a, uh, a gorilla glass cover on on mine. I use the ProMaster crystal protective screen cover thingies and they work great doesn't have just doesn't hurt the touch screen you know it works perfectly so the new battery enel 18d battery um, has the power that the z9 needs 
you I'm told that you can use any of the ENEL 18 batteries, the A, the B, the C, the, or the D. Um, the new charger, the MH33 battery, tiny. For those of you who've seen the chargers for the other batteries, they're big, takes two batteries at a time. They cost about 300 bucks a piece if you, if you ever lose or break one of the chargers. But the new charger is tiny. It's just a half an inch bigger than the battery itself. The new small charger, I'm told, will only charge the new batteries, the ENEL 18D batteries. Yeah. Um, needless to say, we ordered a, as many batteries as we ordered cameras from Nikon. <laughs> when are the cam when are the batteries gonna ship? We don't know. We'll talk more about shipping later. Um, but the, just just to give you an idea, so that um, D version of the battery is 36 watt hours. I have the C version of the battery I just pulled out of my D6, and that's 27 watt hours. Holy cow. So, so you really do want to use the D batteries if you can. You're yeah. going to get more um, life out of the camera, longer life out of the camera. Uh, I did ask around, and um, let's see, it's down here somewhere. It's on, it's on my page. You can USB charge. Uh, a B, C, or D battery in the camera. Okay. You can't, you can't charge the original or the A in the camera. Um, okay. And um, can the camera be powered by USB? Yes. And any battery can be in the camera when it's powered via USB. But I think you have to have a, a battery in the camera. I, I'm not 100% sure about that last one, but it doesn't matter what, what battery is in the camera. But we're going to see some fallout, uh, um, the fall off between the different batteries that, because Nikon has kept goosing the amount of energy in these batteries over time. So if you've got old uh, original or A or B batteries, and even the C battery, um you're probably going to want an extra d battery um you, to play it safe uh, that's going to give you the best bang for the buck in terms of length of time that you can shoot with it you know a couple of people have talked to me tom about so mark why did they go to the big battery why didn't they use the enel 15 batteries because all of this performance comes with the need for power and more power higher 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 power input so that you can pr perform all these these tasks and also i don't know about your response your your experience with the d6 is i can shoot all day pretty much on one battery and not have to worry about changing at a football game or an event i can go the whole day on one battery well you know <laughs> It's going to change from the D5 and D6 to the Z9, and I just don't know how it's going to change yet. Uh, I used to be able to shoot with my D5 for almost a week in Africa without pulling the battery and putting a new one in. So, you know, two weeks safari, all I needed was two charged batteries. Um, I don't think that's going to be true with the Z9. <clears throat> I think I'm going to be charging batteries occasionally. Uh, but I don't know what that is yet. We won't know until uh, we have cameras in hand and can put it into real life testing. Correct. All right. So now we're off to any, now we're off to the lenses, you know, the lens that almost everyone you know, <laughs> pretty much universally asking for is the 100 to 400 lens. Very excited about this lens. And it's got really good, MTF numbers again. Nikon's MTF numbers are theoretical, not measured, but uh, nevertheless, it has really good numbers, um, and so I expect it to perform quite well. Um, <clears throat> you can use a TC uh, teleconverter with uh, it, uh, which is interesting. Um, and I noticed that a couple of the sample images that Nikon gave us uh, use the teleconverter. Um, the image on the left there was at 400 millimeter f5.6, I know for sure, um, because I've been looking at uh, all these images uh, uh, carefully, but uh, uh, the eyes are perfectly sharp on that. In fact, I've had those. 
I had those. Uh, we can actually look at that. I know Nikon probably doesn't want me to do that, but if you can put um, if you can put that screen up as the main screen. swap us out um, i can't because we're equal presenters they can draw they can drag me smaller okay so if you want to drag him smaller and see uh, i'm in lightroom with pictures it was supplied to us by nikon i just zoomed all the way in um it looks pretty damn good yeah um i mean i'm not going to complain about that at all so um if that's what this lens does I'm happy. I'm going to be happy too. So, yeah. So, what are we going to use the 100 to 400 for for wildlife, for sports? Um, you know, you you saw some handball pictures earlier. You know, very tough situation to shoot indoors, low, extremely low light, and focusing super fast action with a 5,000 f 5.6. So, uh, somebody asked the question about the seventy to two hundred with the TC two versus the one hundred to four hundred. Yeah, the one hundred to four hundred will be better. Uh, I'm I'm convinced of that. The seventy to two hundred with the two times converter is actually pretty good. I've it is really using, good. Yes, I, I've been using it for a number of things. I'm I'm not displeased with that at all. Uh, you know, most of you who know me. No, I'm not a fan of teleconverters. Uh, I stopped using them for a long time uh, with the DSLRs because they just took too much away. But, uh, you know, the 1.4 on the 70 to 200 is really, really good. And um, the two times on the 70 to 200 is good. Um, you'll see on my site, if you go to zsystemuser.com, um, I have some preliminary uh, takes on uh, my use of those converters. Uh, so there's more words uh, than what I just said, but it still says the same thing. Great with the 1.4, good with the two. So the new walk around lens, as I like to think of it, the 24 to 120, you know, a lot of you have asked for something a little bit with a little bit more zoom power. So here we go, 24 to 120. That's been a classic in the Nikon stable for Oh my gosh, 20 years now, the 24 to 120. Right. Just be aware that it does uh, extend uh, with Zoom. Yes. So Krishna asked, do you think it's going to be better than the 24 to 200? I certainly hope. Well, yes, it's an S-line lens. So. It should be given that designation. Uh, again, the proof is in the pudding with all of this. Right. We're very early on. We're all excited. We all want to get this stuff in our hands and start using it. Um, to see just how good it is. But, you know, the images that I've seen that Nikon has shared with us and, and Mark is showing some of them uh, here, I've looked at them at 100%, played around with them, looked at them uh, a little more carefully. They're all very good images. So uh, I'd be perfectly happy with uh, that level of image. Um, so a couple of questions. Is the 100 to 400 PF? No. Somebody asked, how is it going to balance on the Z6? It's this pretty much the same feeling spec as a 70 to 200. So if you if you have a 70 to 200, or if you have a local camera store, go in and try the 70 to 200. Um, we'll see. You know, it, it, the specs seem to be very close there. Yeah. So here's the new FTZ2. Um, I've been told that functionally it's identical to the ftz1 the only difference is it does not have the tripod mount on it making it a little bit sleeker and one of the reasons why they did away with the tripod mount is for those of you who use the z6 and the z7 with the battery grip on it it's really tight on the battery grip and i'm here it's the same thing on the z9 no, it's so, worse. It's worse on the Z9. If you, in fact, the Z9 that I handled had an FTZ on it at the time. <clears throat> the you can't get your fingers in 
Oh, so you okay? Because the the tripod mount is going to hit your fingers before you can get right. your hands around the grip. So right. it, it definitely they needed to make a new FTZ adapter, but <clears throat> it's no different than the current one in terms of function, as far as I know. Great, perfect. It's ten grams lighter for those of you in Europe. All right. And one of the lenses I'm most excited about, because <laughs> 400 to eight is my, that's my sports lens and that's my Africa Safari lens. And to get 400 to eight with the 1.4 extender built in is very exciting for me. Yeah. No, that, <clears throat> I mean, again, I, I want to see the lens and see how it handles and what its weight is and size, yep. everything else, because the 400 and the balance eight, and the feeling. It's exactly the same thing. The 400 to eight is my favorite lens. And yeah. uh, some of the pictures that you may have seen of my Africa Safari with the, with the, uh, with the uh, Z6 and Z7, uh, some of those pictures were with the 400 millimeter F2.8 lens. So um, it's definitely a lens I take with me if I have the chance to take it with me, but it is a big, heavy lens. So I don't always take it with me, especially. Well, and I and I'm hoping that Canon, you know, Nikon uses the similar design. So Canon and Sony have really shrunk the weight on their super telephotos. I'm hoping Nikon uses that a similar technology to get the, get the weight down. So we'll see without compromising quality, of course, quality first. Yeah. Uh, I mean, We've seen that with some lenses, the 14 to 24 millimeter, for instance, F2.8 um, is a very, <laughs> I mean, compared to the DSLR lens, it's lighter and, and, and more light and it takes filters on top yep. of all that. So that was a big improvement as far as I was concerned. The Absolutely. 24 to 70 F2.8 also smaller than the 24 to 70 F2.8 on the F mount. So, um, Nikon's definitely heard the, the, the make it smaller, lighter. They're just not going to make it worse. Correct. <laughs> they want to make it better. So if they can do all of those things, they are. Um, if they can't do all of those things, they're going to make it better first. Yes, I agree. And I, I, I would support that 100%. So. Right. So somebody asked about the PFs. If you look at the, the, the silhouetted lenses on this chart, uh, it's actually pretty interesting and pretty incredible. That 85 millimeter has to be an f 1.2 uh, lens. It's it's a fat boy, um, and uh, it it has to be a fast lens. It's got it's either one 1.2 or maybe it's faster than that. I don't know, but 1.2 for sure. Um, but all the rest of the lenses, I, I don't know if you really paid any attention to this. The new 26 millimeter lens is smaller than the TC 1.4, which is like, oh, it's a pancake. The 24 millimeter DX lens, which would be equivalent to about a 35 millimeter uh, lens on full frame, also small, as small as the 16 to 50 millimeter zoom collapsed. Yeah, interesting, that's nice. I like that. The 12 to 28 millimeter DX lens, look at it. It's smaller than the 50 millimeter f2.8 macro lens. That's the one that got me really excited because my carry around camera all the time is my uh, uh, Z50. So a Z50 with the 12 to 28 and the 50 to um, 250, or maybe the 24 to 200 would be a two lens travel kit for me that works really, really nice. And that's a small lens to keep on the camera. Then we get up to that 600 millimeter S line on the far right in the back. That's definitely one of the exotics. It's uh, likely to be an F4 with a normal exotic glass. I wonder if it has a TC built into it like this 400 does. I'd be... Well, if you look, if you look at the 400, you know, if it didn't have the TC in it, it would be about the same size or shorter. So, but we're just guessing here, guys. We don't know anything. Yeah, yeah. but it would be nice to if the 600 also had a TC 1.4 in it. Yeah. Uh, that would definitely mean that you have a 400, 500, 600, 800 combination in two lenses, which we don't have in the DSLR world. Yeah. Um, 
but the two surprising ones, um, you know, the the 400 millimeter uh, is the same size almost uh, in terms of length as the 70 to 200 and the 100 to 400 collapsed. That almost has to be a PF. If you look at the, if that's an accurate size, it could be anywhere from F uh, uh, 4.3, 4.5 to F 5.6 in terms of maximum ap aperture. I don't think it can hit F4, but any of those would be happy for me. Um, and then the 800 millimeter also looks like it has to be a PF. Uh, one of the things about the PF lenses, okay, so with the exotic telephotos, they tend to be, in fact, all telephotos, they tend to be, if it's 300 millimeter telephoto, it's 300 millimeters from the front of the lens to the, the, the focal plane. That's the traditional design, optical design for telephoto lens that's been known. It works. It's easy to make really great lenses that way. And that's why everybody does it that way. So 300 millimeter lens is 300 millimeters long approximately. But a 400 millimeter lens that's as long as a 200 millimeter lens has to have an optical uh, design that's different um, than traditional telephoto lenses. So it could be DO like, Canon does, it could be PF like Nikon does. It has to be something different that changes the light path within uh, the lens itself. And that I would say that's true of the 800 as well. So I, I would place a pretty big bet that the 400 and 800 are PF lenses. Don't know what their apertures would be, but um, <clears throat> when you think about it, we also have 300 and 500 millimeter PFs that we can put on the FDZ adapter. So think about that, 300, 400, 500, and 800 PFs. Awesome. And then a 400 with a TC, and then if we had a 600 with a TC, also would be awesome. That would be a great way for Nikon to expand out its lineup very, very rapidly and have something that nobody else has at the, at the telephoto end. And it looks like that's exactly where they're going. So Paul asked, why don't we see a 300 to eight? And I'll answer in my opinion that we did 300 to eight in the DX range when the pro lenses were DX. And since the cameras went to, to full frame, 400 has become the sports lens for me. Uh, at least. Well, I, I would say the 400 and the 120 to 300. Correct. Um, we can forget about the, one, the 120 to 300. I know a lot of sports pros now who just are in total love with the 120 to 300. Yeah. Uh, it gives them a lot of flexibility. Um, and especially if they flip to crop mode uh, occasionally. Yeah. Um, you know, they're, it, it's just an awesome, uh, awesome uh, lens. And I noticed that a number of Nikon's examples that they shot with the Z9 were with a 120 to 300. Yeah. And probably for the same reason, it's a really good lens to start with, but it has that focal range right in a range where it gives you some flexibility for a lot of sports. Cool. So I, I'd rather have that eventually than a 300 F2.8. Yeah, I agree. Okay, so um, Nikon's introduced some new software. And if you haven't seen uh, on my news views page, I have a chart of how all the software kind of integrates together now. Um, NX Mobile Air is interesting. It's sort of what we've been asking for for a long time. I've been doing this in a slightly different form um, with my camera. So when I'm on the sidelines, I have my phone mounted uh, to the side or on top of the camera and it's connected to the camera with a USB cable. And every now and then I squirt everything off via USB into photos. And then from photos, I can do anything I want uh, on my iPhone to get it to clients or et cetera. So, you know, I'll be on, the, on a football field and for the first quarter, I'll shoot. I'll have been making my selections. We now have cameras that allow me to quickly scroll through my selected images. I'll take those, I'll squirt them over via the USB cable to um, my phone, and then from my phone, I'll squirt them out to the client. Well, NX Mobile Air is an attempt to essentially give you that same capability in a little better form, doesn't use photos. Um, there's some nice aspects to this. Uh, I, I don't know how they work yet, but 
um, IPTC captioning uh, is in, in that, I uh, use that uh, from time to time, uh, depends on the client and the sport. Um, and uh, voice annotation, so I can, I can say, hey, uh, photo editor, this is a picture of uh, so-and-so doing such and such. Um, and um, so you can voice annotate. I think I saw somewhere you can voice annotate to text. So you can speak and have it translated into text. Um, the, uh, that, that'll be out at the end of the month. I think November 24th is when they plan to have that available. Um, and it works with other cameras than the Z9 uh, with certain phones. Um, it's exactly what all of us PJs and sports photographers have wanted for a long time. We have to get images to our clients literally in minutes or else they don't want to hire us. So uh, that's the problem that Nikon is trying to solve there. And then the other uh, piece of new software ah, sorry. is... Um, not Michelle Wahlberg, but no. uh, next uh, Tether. And uh, that's a new tethering uh, piece of software. Um, you'll see that he's plugged, uh, you know, what happened to Camera Control Pro? Well, it's still around, but Camera Control Pro is not just focused on tethering. This software is focused just on tethering. Um, I still trying to find out whether it does wireless tethering or not, I think it does with certain transmitters. Uh, and that's another thing that people aren't catching on. The, the wireless transmitter in the Z9 is like a WT6, not like the SnapBridge transmitters that are in the other cameras. Um, tethering is uh, connecting the camera to your computer directly. So when I take a picture, it pops up on the, on the computer. Um, in the studio, when we have clients, uh, standing there watching us take pictures, we want them to be able to see what they're, uh, what we're taking, and have them be able to comment uh, on on that. So, um, this example here is exactly that. Um, you can see that the image that the photographer on the left is taking of the model is up on a big screen where everybody can see it. That's a tethered solution. That software will be out, uh, I believe, on the fourth, which is Thursday. Uh, and again, it works for more cameras than the Z9. Uh, so if you're into studio tethering, uh, you might want to take a look on Thursday and see if that works with your camera and solves a problem that you might have. So I, I've had over the last few months the pleasure to get to know Michelle Valberg. She's a Nikon Canada ambassador. She's a Canadian geographic photographer. And she was one of the testers on the Z9. And she was able to use the Z9 and the 100 to 400 lens and sent me some images. Um, and Michelle, in her, in her um, el so eloquence, said the Z9 is redonkulous. It completely change, changes the way she's photographing. And she did this amazing shoot. I'll post a video of it tomorrow with a hoop dancer in her studio, um, amazing fun images. And she also shared with me images made with the Z9 and the 100 to 400. And these are shot with the 100 to 400 and a 2X extender. Cause she said she's a long lens junkie. She loves to hump the 800 millimeter 5.6 with her in the wild. Um, and was just very impressed with the performance you know, on the 100 to 400 with the 2X, that means F11. And the focus was snappy and quick. And I want to show you this one. Look at the out of focus background. And she was using the eye detect on both the Eagle and the Raven. And the Z9, she said, snapped right in. And for those of you who are interested, Michelle will be here at Paul's photo on Sunday. So she's going to be doing a live Foley, a live portrait workshop here you can sign up for that there is a fee for it but she's also going to give a talk at 10 o'clock in the morning west coast time we'll talk about this in just a minute talking about her experiences with the z9 it'll be a round table discussion michelle myself and our local nikon rep together talking about the z9 so you guys are welcome to sign up for that the talk is free and it's going to be an online presentation 
If you sign up for the workshops, you'll be able to come to the workshops. We'll have a live shoot. We'll have cameras and lenses for you to try. Um, we're in Torrance, California, Larry. It's certainly worth a, a, a small plane ride to get here to hold, the, to hold the Z9 on Sunday. And you won't be able to shoot pictures with the Z9 because these are still pre-production samples. The, the um, slot with the memory card will be taped closed so that you can't put your own memory card, card in it. But you'll certainly be able to hold it to your eye and push the button and make it go click. So, Tom, you want to talk about some disinformation? So one of the things that, and I noticed Nikon's trying to deal with this too. So there's a lot of things that you need to just kind of watch out for. Um, there's some general things that are happening. So people are comparing um, general product lines versus a specific camera. So, you know, the Sony A9 is a great camera. Uh, no doubt about it. I, I like my Sony A1 and... Uh, it's a, it's a, it works for most of the things that I need to do it for, but you know, my a Sony a seven is not the same as a Sony a one. Uh, even the Sony a seven R Mark four is not the same as uh, a Sony a one. Um, there are some great cameras from each competitor, the Sony a one, the Canon R five R six. Those are really good cameras no doubt about it, but be really careful about when somebody generalizes and says, Nikon cameras suck, Sony cameras are better. Those people just haven't used all those cameras and can't make solid judgments about that. Um, there's another thing that keeps coming up. Oh, the Z9 is a response to the Sony uh, A9 or, or, or A1. Um, now, uh, all these camera companies, you know, the Z9 had to have started in terms of its development probably four years ago, the sensor probably at least three years ago. Um, so th this whole notion that, oh, you know, Sony came out with a camera six months ago that is really great. So Nikon had to respond. Nikon was already going to do something. They were already in progress with the Z9. Uh, cameras are not generally in response to anybody. And I saw another piece of disinformation pop up today about Canon, which is, oh, Canon's going to introduce a, a, a R1 in uh, the end of 2022 in response to Nikon Z9. No, if Canon introduces a, a R1 in 2022, it's going to be because they've been developing it for a while. Um, it's just as simple as that. And then there's this other notion that Sony is the only sensor maker in the world. That's not true. There are a number of them. Um, you know, I did, and I don't think it makes a lot of difference. Sony licenses technologies from others. That's how they got stack sensors. That's how they got phase detect autofocus. That's how they got dual gain. Nikon licenses technologies from others. Canon licenses technology from others. The sensor. Um, the image sensor market is very promiscuous. Um, there's a lot of cross fertilization going on. Um, it doesn't really make a difference as to who makes the sensor, but uh, it doesn't seem like this is a Sony sensor, but it, I couldn't care less. It doesn't make a difference. Nikon specified the sensor. They specified it the way they wanted it. It looks like it's going to be a really great sensor. And then you see all these other little pieces of information that just start to pop up. Uh, one that came up and somebody had forwarded me to today is that the Sony A1 has almost 10% more resolution than a, than a Z9. Well, that's somebody who's math challenged because that's not true. Um, it's more like 4% difference in resolution, and that's not enough that you can see it. Yeah, actually, you can't really see 10%. The historical studies say it takes 15 to 20% change in resolution before people can uh, uh, see a difference between two images. And so what's happening right now, and Nikon, I see Nikon responding to this, but I thought I would try and respond to it too, which is there are a lot of people nipping at the edges trying to find fault with the Z9. Well, first of all, the Z9 is not actually out in, in our hands. And so we can't really say how good or great it really is. It's going to be in that realm. It's going to be at least a good camera. It's probably going to be a great camera. Um, you know, it can only sync with flash in certain ways. I don't know how it syncs with flash yet because I haven't tried it. 
Um, people who have tried it say it works just like a DSLR. So I'm not sure what the real downside there is. Oh, the Sony has a, a faster flash sync speed, but that, as it turns out, is only under certain circumstances, the mechanical shutter, not the electronic shutter. Uh, you know, the buffer is not big enough. Yeah, okay. Uh, buffer seems like it's going to be perfectly fine for me, even with an XQD card. Uh, you know, I don't sit there mashing the shutter for 30 seconds, um, two seconds, three seconds, four seconds, five seconds, six seconds worth of uh, buffer is perfectly fine. And the other thing that a lot of people don't talk about is that some of these competitive cameras, when the buffer fills, the camera is dead to you. Uh, the early Sony cameras, once your buffer filled, if you took your finger off the shutter release, you could not change menus, you could not change camera settings, you couldn't put your finger back on the shutter release and start taking pictures again. One of the things I've always admired about Nikon's buffer is that it will keep chugging. Um, so, you know, if you are running at 20 frames a second and the buffer fills, the camera will keep running at the rate that it can write uh, images to the card. And oftentimes that's two or three frames a second. And that's enough um, to make sure that you catch the tail end of something. Um, but the other part of it is lift your finger off the shutter release and put it back down. You'd be surprised at how fast it's back to 20 frames a second or the, you know 14 frames a second or 10, whichever, uh, you know, all the Nikon cameras operate the same way there in that respect. And the camera is still operative in every way, shape or form. So all this naysaying about buffer is just naysaying. Um, and I, I'm getting tired of people trying to find a problem with the camera, you know, frame rate. It only does 20 frames a second. Um, well, it does 30 frames a second JPEG, and most of my uh, most of the clients that might want 30 frames or 120 frames are only going to want JPEGs in the first place. So I don't see the problem. The overall size is too big. The Sony is so much smaller. Um, Okay, well, uh, Sony also is not going to last through a torrential rainstorm on the sidelines uh, without some sort of protection, is my guess. Uh, I can't use, you know, as good as the Sony A1 is, um, it's coming up winter here, and when it starts snowing, I put gloves on, boy, it's going to start getting hard to find those buttons, and that's never been a problem with the Nikon Pro cameras. Um, and, uh, you know, the LCD is awkward. Well, I don't think so, but uh, that's up for you to decide. You can try it uh, you know, when cameras get into the stores and see if you agree with that. You know, the EVF doesn't have nine, um, nine uh, million dots and it only, does only, doesn't work at 120 frames a second. Well, I hate to tell you this, but I'm not using my Sony A1 at nine million dots and, and, um, and, and at, at 120 hertz uh, refresh rate, because that has implications on what the camera can do in terms of speed of capturing images. So I'm using it at a lower uh, dot rate and at 60 hertz anyway, so I'm not sure what the big deal about that is. And then the whole issue of battery, uh, just one thing, SEPA ratings, the typical uh, a SEPA rating says, take your camera, put it on continuous um, uh, shooting at one frame every 30 seconds without um, letting the viewfinder or the rear LCD go dark uh, and use a flash if there's one in, uh, uh, in the camera. SEPA ratings are more about how long the camera lasts. So when you see a SEPA rating that says, let's just say 600 frames, um, that's, um, divide that by half and you have the number of minutes that it, that camera could be shooting uh, continuously. Uh, so 600 uh, frame SEPA rating is 300 minutes. 300, uh, is, 300 minutes is how long? It's a long time, right? It's five hours. How many shots can I do at 20 frames a second in five hours? Quite a few. So I don't think we're going to find the, the number of charges per uh, battery, uh, a number of images per battery charge is going to be an issue. So uh, when these things come up and people start saying, but 
the camera probably has this problem. First of all, they haven't used it. Second of all, none of us have used it to be able to verify what it can and can't do and give you real solid information about uh, all of these things. And three, what they're really trying to do is they're trying to denigrate what looks like it's going to be a really spectacular product. <clears throat> so I just thought I'd throw that out there. I don't usually talk about that, but this has come up a lot um, uh, recently that there's a, been a lot of naysaying. You know, it, it can't be possibly as good as, uh, as, as we think it will be. And that was happening all before the, before the, uh, before the announcement. And then suddenly after the announcement, you'll notice that a lot of the naysaying went away, but it's still there. They're just nipping at the edges, trying to find something that's wrong with the Z9. I doubt that they're going to find anything tangible. Okay, Mark. So when will we know? <laughs> when will we know, Tom? When? When will we know? I'd like to think I'm going to know starting December 4th, but... <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, you know. We don't know. I mean, we will know when we have the cameras. And you guys all know that the world is in a turmoil with production, logistics. You know, Nikon has a target that they are keeping very close to the vest. I sent an email to all of the people who have ordered cameras from us, you know, that Nikon has said this year, does that mean Thanksgiving, Hanukkah, Christmas, or New Year's Eve? Um, I don't know. We'll see. I, I don't know either, but I, the thing I do know is Nikon is in, extremely eager to get cameras into people's hands. So they're going to do it as fast as they can. So you put this in there. You want me to put this in there, Tom. <laughs> yeah, you and I were talking about uh, yes. you know, when people will get cameras. I, I don't know. We don't know. Uh, um, and nobody knows. Nikon can game this and get cameras out faster, but it's going to require a number of things on their part to do. Uh, I know they're excited about this camera, so they very well may try and steal a little, little bit of production from somewhere else to be able to get more of the Z9s out faster. Um, but it's all going to be deter determined by Nikon and how fast they can, how fast they can get the supplies and how fast they can pivot and then get the production done. I agree, and I think this may be the the strongest release that Nikon has ever seen on a camera. So. People have asked, so what's the price? So $54.99, when is the delivery? 2021, the 100 to 400, the 24 to 120, the FTZ, the ENEL 18D, the charger, all of these things, they're related, but they're unrelated. So the cameras are gonna come when the cameras are gonna come, the lenses are gonna come when the lenses are gonna come. And yeah, we're doing the best we can to get the cameras for you so and the lenses so i know a number of you have placed a you've you've placed our pre-order with paul's photo i know many of you have ordered other places if you haven't ordered yet you know we do a priority pre-order and we ask for a deposit so that you guys have a paid order and so nikon considers a paid order as a stronger commitment than just putting your name on a list. That's why we do that for you. And for those of you who are here tonight, we'll off, make an offer for you. So free 128 gigabyte CFE card, if you order, um, no tax if it's shipped out of California and you get a guaranteed place in line. So what that means is somebody can't pay more and go in front of you. People who pay for their camera in full don't go in front of you we keep that line intact and you know right where you are and how things are, how things are going. So um, remember if you're an MPS member, you get, you can ask for priority delivery through the Nikon NPS site. Um, and you're just gonna specify authorized dealer delivery and choose Paul's photo as your dealer portal. So yeah, any questions about that, Tom or comments, Tom? Oh, they're asking what kind of card you're going to give them. <laughs> which which so CFE it's, it's, card? It's, it's the Hoodman Steel CFE card. 
That's they that's, they stepped up to plate to subordinate a little bit of that cost. It's a two hundred dollar card, guys. So yeah, I, that's one I didn't look up. I will look up the specs on yeah. it what its sustained rate is. But um, generally, Hudman's uh, specs are usually pretty good. Yeah, exactly. So where are we we are going? Okay. There you go. So I wanted to talk, I mean, you're all talking about you want a Z9, but I also wanted to talk just a little bit about where we're at with full frame um, mirrorless, um, just really briefly, and we'll try and zip through this. There are three entry level full frame cameras that you can get. The best one, in my opinion, is the Nikon Z5. The second best is the, the, the A7 Mark II. The Canon RP and the Sony A7 Mark II are Kind of getting long in the tooth, um, and um, you know I think the best all around entry full frame camera, if you're interested in in getting one, is going to be the Z5. So from the entry, we go to base. At the base level, I'd say the best camera that you can get there is probably the Canon R6. Um, it's only a 20 megapixels, but it's basically the same as an R5 in almost every other respect. So the focus performance is, is really good. Um, it's really, really well considered camera. It's more expensive than the Nikon Z6 II though. Um, if, you, if you need fast frame rates, I'd pick the Canon over the Nikon, but if you don't need fast frame rates, if you don't need above 5.5 uh, frames per second, I'd probably pick the Nikon over the Canon. And again, you know, Sony just announced the A7 Mark IV, so I don't know how it does, but the Mark III was showing its age even before uh, the, the Mark IV was uh, introduced. I would clearly say the Nikon was a better camera than the Sony Mark III. Then moving up another level to the high res camera, um, I don't kind of put these in any order. They're all really good cameras. Um, you know, so it sort of depends on what features and other things that you're looking for as to which one of these you, you would get. Obviously, if you want the most megapixels, you'd go Sony. If you wanted the best video, you'd probably go Canon. But I'll tell you, the Nikon Z7 II, just like the D850, puts out remarkably good image quality remarkably good and then now, tom that's my that's my daily driver that's right. what i carry in my bag every day well my bag every my everyday bag that has all of my common gear that i carry around uh, for assignments is a c62 z72 and the trio of f28 lenses so yeah no i, I i'm never displeased with picking up anything out of that bag Exactly. And then the last category is what we've been talking about today, the true top end flagship cameras. Again, I wouldn't put them in any order at this point. At this level, you're probably already in amount. So stick with the camera company that you're dealing with, uh, whether you're moving from DSLR to mirrorless or you're already in mirrorless and just want to move up to a flagship. If you're a Nikon user, buy the Nikon Z7. If you're a Canon user, buy the Canon R3. If you're a Sony user, buy the Sony A1. Again, if you can afford it and if you need that level of camera. So I, I, just want, I, I agree I, with that. Yo. I wanted to put all of that out because it's it, as much as we're all caught up in the Z9, um, and it is a very dramatic event. It's a D1 type event where the world is just kind of changed a little bit and the future is going to be different than the past. Um, as much as we want to talk about that, there's a whole range of really great cameras on the market today, um, ranging, you know, from $1,000 for a full frame camera that's pretty damn competent to, you know, $6,500 for a really remarkable other camera. You've got plenty of choice here. You need to sit down and realistically think about what it is you need, what it is you're trying to do, and pick the right camera for you. And no, it's not a Z8 because it doesn't exist. Correct. So I, I want to talk to you guys again. Michelle Valberg will be here Sunday. So live in the, in the CPA classroom. So Sunday marks the reopening of the Creative Photo Academy classroom. Um, you know, we've been closed since February of 2020. 
to be awesome to have a real class here. We're going to have models and shooting and all kinds of fun stuff. But 10 o'clock, she's going to give her Z9 testimonial talk. It'll be a roundtable discussion. It's free. Go to the Creative Photo Academy website, events, Michelle Wahlberg. You can sign up for the free talk or for the workshops. And Tom and I are proud to announce Tom's so, next visit with us. Right. So we, I've been promising this uh, lecture for a long time and all kinds of things came up. Uh, so I wasn't able to do it. Um, but people wanted to know how I got all those great shots in Africa in 2019 with the Z6 and Z7 and why I was saying that the Nikon autofocus is best perfectly fine if you take the time to learn it. So on the 23rd at 5 p.m., I'm going to give a paid uh, talk about um, taking cameras, mirrorless cameras to Africa, uh, some of the things that are involved with doing that. But very specifically, the meat of the talk in the middle is going to be uh, talking about optimizing autofocus performance and the things that you need to be watching for, uh, the things that you can do, the things that you want to do, the things that mirrorless cameras are great at that you might not have realized um, that DSLRs aren't as great at uh, in Africa. So I'll go through all of that. I've been putting that off for a while. <laughs> Again, I did that trip in 2019. I was originally going to do uh, this as a, a in-person lecture uh, here on the East Coast in 2020. And we all know what happened in 2020. And then all kinds of other things happened in between. So I've been postponing that. But I have a really good, solid talk that I uh, want to put together for that. Um, and uh, this is when it'll be. Great. And I'm excited to hear that because the questions that we all get, I have my system for optimizing a camera. It's just like Photoshop. Tom has his way. I have my way. It's not better or worse. I want to see what Tom does. And it's going to certainly be worth $49, guys, to get your camera optimized, to get the most focused performance. And whether you're using a Z6 or Z7, Z6 to Z7 to or the Z9, the focus settings are all very similar right. and the and priorities and the parameters are very much in line. Even so. the Z50 and the ZFC to a large Absolutely. Degree. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, Mark's seen the slides uh, that I prepared for this lecture. So he, he knows that it, there's a lot of meat on this presentation. Um, as with all the presentations, the presentation will be available on a, um, it'll be recorded so you'll have access to it for a certain period of time after the uh, after the uh, lecture itself and of course i'll answer questions um and then the next thing assuming that hey, nikon says they're going to do everything they can to get me a camera before i leave to africa i'm leaving for africa for what i call the three safaris and a wedding tour um, I'm going to three new lodges that I haven't been to before and uh, uh, scouting uh, them. And then I'm going to a wedding of a very good friend uh, in Africa. And uh, so hopefully I'll have a Z9 with me. And assuming I do, we'll have a free event um, after that. Um, so just after Christmas, and I will tell you how things went and what I found out. Um, I'm keeping a, uh, we're going to go back and look through the questions and make sure that we've answered everything uh, in the chat, um, but I'm keeping a set of questions on my website as a kind of a live document that I keep updating as I find out new things. That's the link that you need. It's been updated every day since the Z, um, does this, here's, a, here's a new question that just popped up, will the Z9 still work with SnapBridge? Yes. Um, so um, I'm trying to keep uh, track of all these questions and answer them in one spot. Um, it's a live document, so it keeps changing every day. And um, you know, you'll want to bookmark that and come back every couple of days. I'm using color to highlight um, new information versus information that was already there. So you'll be able to tell new stuff as it as it gets uh, as it gets posted. And like I said here, guys. I'm going to send you a link to the recording of tonight's session. And in that link will be this, the link. I don't expect you to write down that URL. It's a little big. So um, yeah. 
All right, Tom, do you want to start in on the questions? Yeah, I'm going all the way back to the beginning here to see what questions okay. came up. Uh, uh, does the C9 still have, oops, he just changed my chat on me, thanks. Oh, uh, sorry. <laughs> uh now i've lost that question <laughs> just completely changed the scroll uh, da, 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 da. i'll find it again i'm trying to find the start of the questions and we'll just go through them and in, in order right. as fast as we can uh, i'm going all the way back to the beginning these are all the introductions um da, 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 more introductions should I trade my D500 and D850 for a Z9? Um, you have two really great cameras. So what the heck is it that you're missing? Um, I mean, Nikon certainly would love to sell you a new camera. And, and you know, the Zs are, are really good cameras from the bottom of the lineup all the way to the top. Um, so, you know, that's up to you. But those are two really, really good cameras that I mean, tell me a, a crop sensor camera that's on the market today that's better than a D500. There is not one. There's none. The D500 not even close. Is not even close. It's five years old. It still tops every other crop sensor camera that's out there. So if crop sensor is important to you, you're not going to find a better crop sensor camera. Simply not. D850, I still say it's the second best all around camera that you can buy with the Sony A1 being. Uh, the one that I say is the best. I don't know where the Z9 fits there. The Z7 II kind of fits right behind the D850 in, in, in terms of that. It's not a camera that you turn in lightly. It's a really, really good camera. Um, well, but, and, and I, and I, but I will chime in that if you want to convert to Z, I have customers who switch a body and keep all the F mount lenses. But I also have customers who push, you know, they buy a Z camera and one lens and try it for a while to make sure they like it and then push in all their F stuff that is has Z replacements to get the smaller, lighter weight and the better imaging quality that you're gonna see from the Z lenses. Right, so uh, I mean, maybe you keep the D500 because it's a great crop sensor camera yep. and you trade the D850 for a Z72. Right. But that's a that's a maybe, not a yeah. that's what you do. Um, and the reason why you keep the D, I mean, in the telephoto range, we don't have a lot of telephoto lenses out yet. So if the reach is, your, uh, is of your interest, which is probably why you have the D500, then you keep in the D500 for the time being. Does I the agree. C9 still have fine tune, uh, focus tuning in the setup menu? Yes, it does. Uh, in DP review today, there was a Arctic, uh, an interview with a uh, Nikon um, manager talking about why that is. I'm not sure I agree with his answer completely. Um, there are people that do like to change the focus and back focus or front focus slightly from where the camera wants to do it. But the real reason why autofocus fine tune is there, you've got, when you put an FTZ adapter on uh, your camera, you now have two mounts. Uh, any mount tolerance at all starts to become slightly an issue. Uh, older lenses do tend to lose a little of their pace uh, in terms of their ability to focus fast. And sometimes that'll affect focus a little bit. So there are reasons to have it. Do you need to fine tune focus uh, 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 a Nikon C camera? I've not found that to be the case yet, but that doesn't mean there won't be a case. Um, can I, can I, I tell you what the, uh, the, the head of the Nikon service department in the LA area told me what, what their number one setting on, on Nikon cameras fine, fine focus adjustment is? Zero. Zero. Yeah. Uh, and they spend more time undoing the settings that people have falsely put in than actually making any corrections. Well, I mean, even with DSLRs, um, if you've ever been on one of my workshops in Africa uh, or any of my wildlife workshops, the first thing that my teaching assistant, Tony, and I do is we sit down and we AF fine tune everybody's camera. We want to make sure that it's working. And um, generally speaking, we're never anywhere out of plus three to minus three. 
uh, yeah. and most of them are left on zero. Um, and at plus three or minus three, I might even leave it on zero um, because you know heat and other things will affect focus performance. So um, yeah, no, it's it's not a big thing. Should I rent a Z9 or a second Z7 for Botswana next year? If you're going on one of my workshops, um, you you've already just got an email from me uh, for next year. Um, email me that question directly. Uh, I can't answer it if you're not on one of my workshops. I don't know what you're, where you're going or what you're doing or what your interests are. Um, the 100 to 400 versus 70 to 200 with the TC, I already answered that one. The 100 to 400. Um, another cell of Z850, that's going to be a common question here, I think. And the answer is, not unless there's something specific that you gain by moving to a new camera. Uh, it's an incredibly good camera to start with. Yeah, but Tom, there is a factor of some people just like the newest of the new. Well, that's fine. I mean, if you want something, that's a whole different thing. I yeah. can't answer should you buy a new camera or not if it's all about what you like yes. uh, or what you want or yep. Or you need you need you need to max out your credit card again for some reason to collect airline points <laughs> or something. I, I can't answer those questions. But do you? Uh, if you have a D850, you've got a really good camera. It takes really great pictures. Use it to its fullest. Um, does the DR match the Z7? That's an image quality question. We can't answer them yet. Nikon's not answering them. Nobody's answering them. Everybody who's used the camera that I know of seems to be really satisfied with it. I've looked at a lot of images from it. Um, they look good. So what else can I say? Uh, does it have closest subject priority? No, I do not think it does. Um, I'm still trying to get the definitive answer on that, but I'm pretty sure it doesn't. Um, do, 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 do. Do I have any thoughts on the 24, 120 versus the 24 to 70? Well, again, I pointed out that the 24 to 120 does extend when you zoom. Uh, for some people, that might be an issue. Uh, I'm not sure it's a big one. Um, that's, an answer, uh, that's a question that um, is going to take having the lens in hand and testing it before I can really answer it. Um, you know, the 24 to 70 F4 is a really good lens. Uh, it's yeah. probably the best kit lens I've seen from anybody, certainly at full frame. And um, I love that lens because it's so tiny. Which Z camera would I suggest as a D7000 replacement, Z50 or a ZFC? Uh, can you record video in portrait mode with a Z9? Well, sort of. <laughs> Uh, are you talking about you, that? I mean, you can turn the camera sideways. Uh, you could certainly do that. But what are you going to do with that footage when it gets into Final Cut Pro and Premiere? There are TikTok, ways, baby, TikTok. There are there are ways to take or uh, uh, footage that was recorded that way and make it look like TikTok in a in Final Cut Pro and Premiere. But um, you can't do that in the camera that I know of. Is there a Z8 around the corner? I wouldn't expect one into for at least a year, probably a little bit more. Uh, the problem with EVS is they don't hold dynamic range rail. Well, guess what? This one has three times brightness than uh, the others. So you might have to reevaluate that. Um, I already told you who the woman uh, uh, behind me is. Uh, that's my test head. Um, can I move the bottle in the foreground? I did that, yeah. Uh, but is the autofocus of the Z9 not better? Uh, I don't know how to answer that question. Uh, how do you think the train plane autofocus is going to work? Everything I've seen so far looks really, really good. Um, so I think so, it's going to so work come really, watch really well. Come on Sunday and hear Michelle. She'll talk about that. Yeah, I think it's going to work exactly yeah. the way you want it to work. Yeah. Um, uh, for short birds, I believe Z9 solves a lot of problems in those scenarios. Yeah, I think so. Um, certainly, if you need a higher frame capture rate, and sometimes you do with small birds, 
and small shore birds uh, to get the thing that you want. With the big birds, you can generally go at a slower frame rate, but with the small birds, and especially you know the rollers that are going all over the place, a high frame rate probably is, is uh, better. And the Z9 is the best high frame rate camera that Nikon is going to be making for the immediate future. And look what Christy Odom did with the uh, Picas. Uh, you're Those, right. Yeah. So that to me is a very similar type approach. How is the high ISO performance? We don't know. Uh, how many raw images before the buffer fill? We covered that one. Uh, there, there were, I noticed a lot of questions about high efficiency uh, raw and Nikon's being kind of coy with that right now. There is a file format called high efficiency image file format or HIF and hike files, which are what Apple and Canon and now Sony have done in their cameras are a form of HIF. I'm not sure if this isn't another form of HIF with some sort of codec that I don't know about. We just have to wait to get cameras and, and start dissecting files to be get a good, good idea of what's going on with high um, efficiency raw. Now, um, Nikon is saying that um, lossless is like uncompressed and high efficiency raw star is like um, the best previous compressed uh, and visually lossless. I think they've returned to that word visually lossless. Um, so that bodes well. I just need to see it and be able to verify that. Can't do that yet. Is the Z9 a, a D850 and a D500 replacement, uh, same question. Um, I've already answered. Which Canon Sony will beat the Z9? I don't know, but if you're a Canon user, you should be looking at the R3 and the R5 and the R6. If you're a Sony user, you should be looking at the A1, the A9 Mark II, the A7 Mark IV, and maybe the A7 Mark IV uh, that just came out. Again, another camera I can't speak to. How soon do I think Nikon will trickle down the important Z9 features? Um, I think that Xpeed 7 will probably trickle down in 2022. Any camera that's introduced uh, in 2022 by Nikon, which uh, we're sort of expecting at the end of the year might be a Z6 III and a Z7 III. I would tend to expect those are Xpeed 7 cameras and not Xpeed 6 cameras. Don't know about underwater subjects yet. Uh, uh, I certainly don't have a Z9, but if I had a Z9, I wouldn't be submerging it at the moment. Um, and I don't know if anybody has even got a... Um, got a uh, 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 something to put it in uh, to take it underwater. So it's going to be a little while. Um, will the three times brighter EVF make a meaningful improvement? Uh, I think so. Do, 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 do. How about Panasonic like pre-capture at a high frame rate? Well, actually Olympus, I think was one of the first ones that did that where they capture, where they're capturing, a, if you have your finger half pressed on the shutter speed, they're capturing a burst and putting it into the buffer. And then if you press your finger, they'll actually save some of the stuff that was in the buffer. Um, the Z9 to my knowledge does not have that. Um, there are only a couple of cameras I know that do have that. It is a useful feature if uh, if you've ever tried that, the, that's one of the nice things I like about the, the OM-1. Uh, how did Nikon get around the 30-minute video restriction? Um, well, the 30-minute video restriction originally partly was because of European tariffs. Uh, those are now gone. Uh, but then the next thing that happened was that if you, have, if you run silicon really hard for a long time, that uh, it starts to overheat. So people were putting arbitrary limits. Uh, what Nikon's telling us is that the video doesn't overheat um, the way you might expect it to. So uh, that's probably based upon the silicon. Uh, any advantages of the Z9 
over the Z7 for landscape photographer. As it stands right now, I haven't heard anything in particular that I would say, aha, that is something that definitely stands out. Now, whether or not there is or not is a whole other story. So wait, wait, 10 pin, if you have 10 pin remote control for some kind of a, like the lightning capture, the interval intervalometer, um, the flip up screen for doing for doing low angle in portrait mode. Well, that would be the one thing that I, I would point to in landscape that oftentimes I want to do more than just tilt the screen yeah. up and down, uh, that there are definitely times I want to see it from the side uh, in, when I'm down low in landscape photography. So there are probably some things that you might think are better. But I'm, I, there's just nothing that really stands out in a way that would make me say, oh, I've got to have a Z9 instead of a Z7 for landscape. Uh, are there are things that address workflow? Yes, absolutely. Um, one of the things that stands out to me, and I've only, <laughs> I mean, I saw this very, very briefly, but it was exactly what I want, which is the ability to be marking frames as I'm taking them and you know, when I'm on the sidelines, I'll be, I'll be chimping stuff and trying to mark stuff so that I can find it faster in the, in the, so we now have abilities to scroll through just by marked frames. Um, and um, that would mean that it would be really easy to find a marked frame, squirt it out via snap bridge, find my next marked frame, squirt it out via snap bridge. So there are a whole host of workflow things like that, that, uh, that, uh, um, you would, would find uh, the Z9 sensor or uh, cropped a tad, you mean 23 by nine by uh, 35 by nine. Uh, that's pretty common. Uh, it's what the number of fix, pixels that fit into the, the space and then they round the number. Um, so there's no real crop there. Um, well, function one transaction, transition function and horizontal use trans I don't know the answer to that question of whether or not it transitions or not. I wasn't able to look at the custom settings very deeply. Um, this dynamic range, uh, we've answered that uh, and, and we're not answering that because we don't know. Uh, what is the customizations we can do with the various buttons? I've heard that they've been expanded from what they were before. I don't know exactly what that is. I didn't have a chance to scroll through the entire list um, and I did, didn't see um i didn't they didn't take anything away as far as i could tell they may have added stuff and tom uh, i was told that the menu on the customization of the buttons looks like it does on the z72 where you have all of the functions and that you could actually bring there was a bill an ability what what, what did he tell me you could bring other stuff in there if it wasn't there. I, I heard that too, but I haven't seen it. So I don't know what that exactly what that means and what other stuff you can or, or couldn't bring in. Well, do, do, I, do. Would, I would think that to be is, let's say for example, you wanted white balance to be on custom function four and custom function four didn't have I mean, function button four didn't have white balance as an option because that's a buttonable thing. You could make it, make it an option. There. That's how I heard that. That's the way I interpreted it too, but um, yeah, you know, we're that, guessing. It takes, we're guessing, it takes, guys. It takes a camera in my hand that's finished right. for me to answer that question for sure. Do we have pixel shift? Not that I know of. Um, highlight alerts, zebras and EF for still shooting. I'm not sure about that one. Do we have a photo of the bottom of the camera? No, Nikon did not supply one. Um, the, 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 who did Nikon work with to design the Z9? Uh, are you talking about the styling of the hand grip, et cetera? I'm pretty sure they did that themselves, but that's still all based on uh, the Italian designer from a long time ago. They're still using design cues that he, he gave them but they're now working that through themselves. Is there a focus assist light? No, I don't know if the flash focused assist light can be used yet. Uh, I did have Mark when he had the camera test red sensitivity 
um, of the focus system, and it seems like it's more sensitive to red than the than the current cameras, but we don't know anything for sure there. Uh, will there be moray? Well, you don't have a you don't have a, a low pass sensor, so there will be circumstances that generate moray. Does it have, have you focus? ever shot with moray? Have you ever had moray? Um, oh yeah, yeah, exactly. When you don't want it. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's never there. You'll look for it and you'll look for it. You'll look for it. And then you'll be out on a shoot and it just pops up at exactly the wrong time. Um, yeah, that's that's a tricky one. I just had it once on a screen on a window. I was uh, shooting I've a seen, house. I've seen that. Uh, the one thing if you're shooting models in a studio or even you know, sometimes we go out and shoot sports figures yeah. with their uniform on in poses and kind of semi studio stuff. We take our lights out and you know, set it up and, and, and do post shots with them. You have to watch with you have to look at the fabrics of the uniforms and stuff very carefully and see if it's likely to trigger moray. And if it is, yeah. then you have to do some more investigation. Does it have focus shift uh, uh, shooting? Yes, I believe it does. That was the answer I got from Nikon when I asked. Um, any expectation of 30 FPS lossy raw in, firm, in a firmware update? Expectation, I can't say. Is it possible? I think it might be. Um, so we'll see. Um, shutter rate dial on left screen only now. I'm not sure what that question is. I'm still only halfway through the questions. Um, will the original F2 uh, uh, TZ adapter work? Yes, it will. But if you put it on the Z9, the tripod uh, holder is going to be in the way of the vertical grip space. Um, 120 frames, 11 megapixels. That's JPEG only, not RAW. Um, there is no medium sized RAW, there's no small RAW, there's no 12 bit RAW. It's all large, full size, full resolution RAW at 14 bits, no matter what RAW setting you set. Um, is the 11 megapixel line skipper full FX frame? Yes, it's full X, it's the full frame. Um, can you do a 120 frames per second burst with a custom button? I don't know the answer to that question. I suspect no. Um, but remember, there's a drive button up on the top on the button, so it will be very easy to get to no matter what. Um, were there any computational features like Live Composite Pro Capture? Uh, none that I saw. Uh, that doesn't mean there aren't um, things buried in the camera. Um, there are definitely a lot of changes. And we even saw some changes, uh, which a lot of people passed over uh, with the Z6.2 and Z7.2 firmware updates. Uh, this whole ability to change tint uh, of essentially skin tones is on top of your ability to change tints uh, with white balance. Um, it's a very nice uh, thing. You know, somebody wait, wait, so... My... I think Matthew Jordan Smith in his presentation talked about shooting in sepia. So. Well, okay. Again, so with all the Nikon cameras now, uh, you, you have creative picture controls and you have picture right. controls. And with the creative picture controls, the very interesting thing is that you can mix them with a regular picture control. So if you just want a hint of sepia-ness, to a regular JPEG. You know, you just want to throw a little grading, sepia grading yeah. in there. You can do it. And you can do it in any intensity that you want. So how do you do that? Well, the thing that people have not been picking up on anywhere near enough, and I need to do a need to do a, a seminar on this or a quick video on this. We have live view on these cameras and the I button gets us to almost all of this stuff really, really quickly and allows us to like just set it and watch what happens. Yep. Um, so you can you can change and do that mix of picture control while you're looking at the scene in front of you. 
So you can make that decision in real time, as you can with white balance, as you can with hue, as you can with virtually everything that's uh, going to change the look of a JPEG. For settings, is there ability to save settings to something other than one file per card? I don't know the answer to that yet. Um, we do have banks on the camera and we have it in multiple places and we have extended banks. So I wouldn't be surprised if we have ways to save those. Uh, what about shutter lag? Don't know what the shutter lag is. Uh, what, I mean, I was able to press the shutter and quite frankly, there's no real shutter lag on a Z7 II. So, I mean, it's almost as good as what the pro cameras were 10 years ago. Yeah. So, uh, no, uh, lag, lag is not an issue and uh, viewfinder lag is not an issue as well. Um, the, the, okay, I'm getting almost two thirds of the way. I've answered those questions before. Can you shoot stills while capturing video? Um, I don't know the answer to that, but I do know the answer uh, that you can extract stills from the video that you shot in the camera. Uh, so you get a 33 uh, megapixel uh, still from 8K and you get a eight megapixel still from 4K. So you're going to get a 33 or an eight megapixel JPEG from the video that's file that's correct um and you can you can do that on the camera and you can pick the still and scroll through and find exactly the frame yep. that you want I which would i find to you, be more i find that to be more of a useful feature than pressing the still button in the middle of a video and getting what you want trying to get what you want i don't know if i agree with that i, I on my sony i actually do take stills while i'm taking video Oh, okay. Uh, and, the, and there are times when I found that useful. So I would like okay. to see that in the Nikon cameras yeah. as well. Uh, how is high efficiency decompressed? We have no idea. The minute I know, you'll know. Is Angel Bird an off brand? Heavens no. Angel Bird is a, a strong brand, um, very Hollywood centric. Um, they've been doing uh, you know stuff for big Hollywood. Uh, uh, cameras, uh, the red cameras uh, use, uh, some of them can use Angelbird cards. Um, yes, CFE cards can get hot. Uh, generally speaking, they do get hot. I, uh, well, generally speaking, what I found is that the ones with high sustained frame rates don't get as hot as the ones with lower sustained frame rates. It's another reason to buy the more expensive cards, unfortunately. Can the screen be reversed to protect glass? We answer that no. Uh, bah, 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 bah. He already told you he's getting as many batteries as cameras, he hopes. <laughs> I bet uh, not, but we yeah. ordered as many batteries as cameras. <laughs> well, I said you hope. Yes. Um, what do you think about the use of stepper motors versus linear motors? You know, what I think is, does the focus system work? And if the answer to that is yet yes, I couldn't care less if it's a stepper motor, a nano motor, a linear motor, dual motor, single motor, uh, wave motors. God, there's a ton of other kinds of motors there could be. Uh, Nikon's obviously using stepper motors for a reason. Um, and they've gone to the, I don't know if you've caught it or not, but they've gone to the point where they're making their own um, electronic chip to drive stepper motors. So they have a specific chip that they stick into lenses that's optimized for their stepper motors. So, um, so far I haven't had any problems with uh, focus uh, on Zs and uh, so stepper motors are just fine. Uh, will the lenses and FTC ship at the same time as the camera? No. As far as I know, everything's coming out as soon as Nikon can get it to you. And those will be different dates for each of those is what I was told. Um, uh, ergonomics of the Z9 versus other brands I've used. Well, I, I mean, I like the Z9 grips uh, uh, compared to other cameras. I like the Nikon positions of controls. And I think I've talked about this before with people. There's a reason why Nikon's hand positions are where, where they are. So I can keep my finger here on the shutter release while changing settings with my uh, middle finger on the front command dial and my thumb on the rear command dial. 
Now, it used to be that they had all their buttons on the left side, so it was really easy to do. You press a button on the left side, and then you change stuff with the right side, but my finger is still hovering over the shutter release all the time. Now, Canon had rows of buttons with multiple functions on them right behind the shutter release, and then they had a horizontal and a uh, they had two vertical things and that sort of made you move your finger off the shutter release to change settings. I much prefer the Nikon approach. Uh, Sony sort of adopted the same approach. Panasonic sort of adopted the same approach. I think it's the preferred approach and the Italian designer who told him to do that in the first place was right. Uh, so let's not change that, please. Um, there are buttons on the left side up here on the Z9. And there's, of course, the focus mode button uh, comes back on the Z9. So there are left hand side buttons that would be really fast to change while my finger is still sitting over that shutter release. Um, lighter weight, I don't know yet. Um, no specs. Uh, we talked about that already. Are we going to get new cameras every couple of years? Yes, of course we're yes. going to get new cameras every couple Nikon's of years. Nikon's not going out of business, guys. They're going to um, keep making cameras. Uh, and, and then nor is Sony and nor is Canon. Right. But you don't buy new cameras every two years. In fact, it used to be, and Nikon had it set up so that the big new camera release was every eight years. Um, and that was perfectly fine in the film era. Um, you know, I could about after about eight years, I really wanted a new camera because I had abused the hell out of my old one. Um, in the DSLR era, that moved to four years, and that's plenty enough. Uh, if you're moving to a new camera every four or five years, you're getting a lot that's improved. If you're trying to do it every year or every two years, you're, you're not going to get as much that's improved, except every now and then when a, a, a camera comes out like the Z9 that changes things considerably, or like the A1 did. Um, those would be reasons to move to a new camera off your regular schedule, perhaps. But generally speaking, most people should be skipping generations. You know, If you bought the Z6, wait for the Z6 III. If you bought the D800, wait for the D850. You know, skip a generation uh, is the right thing to do most of the time. Uh, we answered the tethering stuff. Uh, you answered where you're located. We're getting towards the end. Um, any security fi features to lock the camera out and deter armed robbery? Yes, there is. Believe it or not, <laughs> not the feature you're thinking about. It has a Kensington lock um, uh, capability on the side. So um, you can lock up your camera with a Kensington um, lock and chain. Um, a lot of us do leave, you know, our cameras vulnerable when we're shooting sports and it's a nice thing to be able to do, but it, I think you probably mean, do I need a, uh, can I, uh, do I have to enter a password to get into the camera? No, that's not, not, not there. Uh, do my F lenses have any value at Paul's camera? Well, I could answer that question. Uh, some of mine that I've traded in had good value. Um, so, you know, then Paul's is one place you can trade them. There are other places you can trade them, but he's, he's done a good job, a uh, good deal with me. Uh, I'm not displeased with the money he's given me uh, on the things that I've traded in. Uh, what features might flow down to the firmware updates for the Z6 to Z Z7 II? That's a tough question because it's using the older processor and it's using sensors that don't have the same readout speed. So it would be things that don't require that. Um, can they improve the focus on those cameras? I think so, a little bit. Will they? Maybe, I don't know. That's up to them. They keep saying that they're committed to doing uh, firmware updates that add functionality. So I think we probably see some more. They just did that. They added some interesting functionality with the latest Z6 II, Z7 II firmware release. And I think we'll see a few more of those things uh, happen. Uh, have I met Mark Cruz? Yeah, I answered that one in the in in the mail. Mark is an incredible guy. He's exceptionally smart. He's really good at remembering and understanding all these things. 
and explaining technical stuff. Um, him and Mike, uh, I think him and uh, Mike uh, did a wonderful job in the uh, launch. Um, you know, I can't praise them too much for their ability to kind of keep it all calm and sane while McNally like wants to, ah, it's a great camera. <laughs> um you know that 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 it was a it was a really good presentation and it was well well uh, organized and mark came through with a lot of details and he's still coming through with a lot of details so um he's a great guy um there's a the, the, will the z8 be 61 megapixels i'm guessing no uh but that's a guess will bmw prevent nikon from naming a camera z8 I uh, don't think so. Can we buy the presentation afterwards? Um, you can get the video. You'll get it in the link, and we'll keep. So that that, that was during when we were talking about your Z6 Africa. I, I think we'll do the same thing there. We'll leave it up for people who paid for it. Uh, we'll right. we'll leave it up for a period of time so they'll be able to look at it again. Um, pixel shift. I answered. I'm almost to the end. Any sense that the Z9 has cross sensor like behavior? You know, I gave Mark some tests because he had more time with the camera than I did um, to try, and it seems to seems to indicate it might. Uh, but I didn't get the right subjects to photograph to try. Yeah, right, and and it's going to take some testing to answer that for sure. But it certainly seems to be more red sensitive than before. Uh, da, da, da. Best camera for sports. Uh, if you want in focus images, I'd say a D6. Um, followed closely by a Sony A1 and perhaps a Z9. As soon as I have a Z9, I'll be able to answer that question and where it fits. Nikon is thinking that it's better than a D6. And if that's the case, great. That's the camera I switch to for sports. Uh, we answered that question. Are there any raw images available for download anywhere? Not that I've seen. Um, and there's no way to read them yet. How many minutes of 8K, 30K video on a 256 gigabyte card? I actually figured this out and then I've lost my piece of paper. I wrote it down <laughs> on. Um, I was trying to figure out if, if I like maxed it out, absolutely pro res, uh 8k video at the highest frame rate um for 125 minutes and i know the answer was i would have to change cards <laughs> um but i can't remember the exact the exact answer uh, listen these bit rates that are being thrown out and the amount of data that's being thrown out are huge um so if you're doing video on these cameras you want a one terabyte card, I'm pretty sure. You yeah. certainly want a 512 gigabyte card at least. And be prepared to switch it often. Uh, exactly. First impressions on the new menu system. There are good things and bad things about it. Uh, I think I mentioned the thing I didn't like, type A, type B, type C. Give it real names. Don't, don't use the type A thing over and over again. Um, however, on the flip side, Playback menu is not the first menu on the camera. Photo shoot -a menu is the first menu on the camera. Playback menu, which we rarely use, is farther on down the menu system now. So Nikon has listened to a lot of things that we talked about um, in terms of improving the menus for us to get through them, pick things. It's easier to say OK on stuff. So there are good things in the men new menu system for sure. I just don't know all of them yet because I had literally maybe 60 seconds to look at menus. <laughs> and, and part of that time, I was just trying to memorize everything I saw. Um, you know, so uh, does this, we answered that one. Are you staying with F lenses or transitioning to Z? Well, that sort of depends. So my Z6 camera, the things that I've been using it for events and stuff like that, um, I used it for, um, when I shot the lacrosse championships, um, I used the Z6 for the 
when they won the champion, the team I'm covering won the championship. I picked up my Z6 in the 24 to 70 and was running around, trying to run around and keep up with these guys as they were celebrating all over um, the field. Um, you know, for that sort of thing, I'd definitely be going with Z lenses. Uh, for sports and wildlife, I you know, mean, there's some really great uh, F mount. Uh, lenses for those things and for the time being i'm sticking with them until nikon gives me something better uh that and that's my answer and i'll stick to it uh we're almost to the end do you have the front control dial in a mode configured to open the aperture when you push it to the left i.e the old nikon way typically yes um and I have my exposure bar uh, the old way too, not the new way. So, so you know, plus on the right, minus on the left. No, I've got it the other way around. Uh, mainly because that's the way I've been using Nikon since the 60s. Will there be any more Z6 and Z7 firmware updates? Don't know. I suspect so. Uh, have I considered offering my guidebooks in print form? So my guidebooks are all over a thousand pages. You can't bind a thousand page book reliably. So the answer to that question is no, not unless I want to have a Z9 volume one, volume two, volume three, volume four. Now with the smaller books, I've been doing that. You can find my ZFC book and my Sony A1 configuration book. You can find both of those uh, in printed form on Amazon. Um, so I'm trying to handle requests as best as I can, but there are some things that just don't make any sense. And a question just popped up. See, D750 user interested in getting a 70 to 200. I like my D750, but should I consider trading my D750 for something like a Z5 and get the Z version instead of the FL? The FL is one of the best, and until, in fact, until the mirrorless cameras came out, it was the best 70 to 200 I've ever seen. It's an incredibly great lens. Nothing wrong with that lens. The Z version is an itsy bitsy teeny weeny bit better. Uh, I wouldn't call it incredibly better or exceptionally better. It's a teeny bit better. Um, and most people aren't going to notice that. So um if you want to buy a lens that's a dslr lens and then bring it over to the fgc uh, when you eventually go mirrorless you can do that you're not going to really lose out in that particular case now there are other lenses i might not say that about but the 70 to 200 absolutely i i, I don't care which one is on my z cameras um it's the, the difference is small enough that it's just whatever's handy. And, but I would make a comment to her with a D750. I certainly wouldn't do a Z5. I would do a Z6 or a Z7, or even a Z6 or Z6 II. Uh, I think that's a better crossover than a Z5. Right. As a matter of fact, if for how many people? We, we still have 150 people here. Yeah. So it's probably worth, probably worth saying this. So in, in Nikon terms, uh, a D600 and Z, D610 is a Z5. Uh, D700-750 is a Z6. Uh, 800, 810, or 850 is a Z7. And a D45 or 6 is a Z9. So if you're, if you're thinking about making a straight over transition that you like this class of camera, um, in the DSLRs, and you want something similar in the in the in the in full frame mirrorless, that's the way you do it. D six hundred users move to the Z five, D seven fifty users move to a Z six, D eight fifty or D eight hundred users move to a um, Z seven, and of course the D five and D six users move to a Z nine. Yeah. Uh, where is the D500 and Z, the Z mirrorless? It is missing in action at the moment, but I will repeat what I said before, and people really need to hear this. There is not a better crop sensor camera on the market today than a D500, and it's a five-year-old camera. Not a single one. 
And, and I can tell you, Tom, our sales on D500s, it's just like 850s. We get them in, they go out almost right. immediately. Now, the only caveat I'd put on that statement I just made is if you're doing high-end video, the right. D500 is not a video camera. No. Um, it does video, but it's not a high-end video camera. Some of these later latest crop sensor cameras, even a even the ZFC that I'm looking at right now will do better um, high-end video than the Z500 will. But in terms of stills, you're not going to top it. The Fujifilm yeah. X-T4 doesn't top it. Um, the OM-1 doesn't top it. Um, the Sony A6000 series, there's not one there that tops it as far as I'm concerned. The D500 is the best crop sensor camera that you can get. So the next question that came up is, uh, will anybody still buy the D5 or D6? Well, I would hope so. The D6 is an incredible camera. Um, a lot of people don't realize how far it went from the D5. It didn't seem like a lot of change to it, but I'll tell you that focus system, just like the what Nikon is talking about with the Z9 focus system as being a step forward, the D6 focus system was a clear step forward over the D5. Uh, the D6 system is sticky, it's fast, um, it doesn't have some of the liabilities when you start getting to the small apertures that the, Z, uh, the D5 system did. You, you don't lose cross sensors as fast, uh, if at all, in some cases. Um, it doesn't have gaps in the focus sensor area like uh, the D5 and the D500 had. They had small gaps that you had to be aware of. Uh, it has the ability to configure groups the way you want groups done. I mean, D6 is an incredible camera. There's, uh, I mean, if you've got F-mount lenses and you're doing the kinds of uh, photography that requires uh, that level of camera, uh, absolutely, you'd still be buying it. And did I try fast birds flying with the Z9? No, because there were no birds where the camera was when I was holding it. Uh, and there wasn't much of anything that was moving uh, other than me where I was holding it. So I can't. So Mich Michelle's going to talk about eagles on Sunday. If you have questions, she'll she'll have that. She because she photographed eagles with the with the Z9. So anyhow, I think it's probably about time to wrap this up. I agree. Um, why would I change from a D6 over a why would a change from a D6 over a D850 be appropriate? Uh, specifically high frame rates with uh, incredible focus. That would be the reason to move to a D6 over a D850. Um, and that's the only reason I could think of. But um, for sports photography, um, uh, the D6 is incredible ca camera. Somebody, I, I didn't answer this because somebody asked about when will my D6 book be out? Well, if Nikon keeps releasing cameras, it's going to be a little while more, but I was trying to finish it, uh, finish it up uh, this month, but uh, it's, 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 it's iffy. Um, I'm well into it. I got a lot of stuff to cover. Uh, there were a lot of interesting changes that are subtle. Um, and uh, it's currently at like almost 1200 pages. So uh, holy cow, uh, it's, it's a pretty big book. It'll be out soon. All right. And so thanks for everybody. Hope you enjoyed Thank it. you, Tom. Thank you, everyone who's still left. We've got about a little less than half the people still with us. We were close to 300 at the max. So thank you, guys. Thank you all. Thank you, Tom. Thank you for your continued support of Paul's Photo. We want to be your local camera store wherever you are. If you have a camera store in your neighborhood, please support them. If you don't, give me a call. We'll be glad to take care of you. I can't wait to talk to you again, Tom. And maybe next time. We'll both have new cameras, right? Maybe. The next time is going to be the, the Z6 and Z7 in Africa. I think that's still going to be a couple of days before I get my camera, but um, we'll see. I'll keep my fingers crossed. Uh, Nikon, yep. if, you're, if you're hearing this, you really need to get me a camera. There's a lot that I can show people <laughs> what to do with that camera. Um, All right, guys. Good night, everyone. Thank you.